Section 41 of Mosquitoes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mosquitoes by William Faulkner. Third day, 9 p.m. But I saw him about four o'clock, Fairchild argued. He was in the boat with us. Didn't you see him, Major? But that's so. You were not with us. You saw him, Mark, didn't you? He was in the boat when we started. I remember that, but I don't remember seeing him after Ernest fell out. Well, I do. I know I saw him on deck after we got back, but I can't remember seeing him in the boat after Jenny and Talia Farrell. Ah, he's all right, though. He'll show up soon. He ain't the sort to get drowned. Don't be too sure of that, Major Ayer said. There are no women missing, you know. Fairchild laughed his burly, appreciative laugh. Then he met Major Ayer's glassy, solemn stare and ceased. Then he laughed once more, somewhat after the manner of one feeling his way into a dark room, and ceased again, turning on Major Ayer's his trustful, baffled expression. Major Ayer's said, this place to which these young people went today, Mandeville, the Semitic man supplied. What sort of place is it? They told him. Ah, yes, they have facilities for that sort of thing, eh? Well, not more than usual, the Semitic man answered, and Fairchild said, still watching Major Ayers with a sort of cautious bafflement. Not any more than you can carry along with you. We Americans always carry our facilities with us. It's living high-tension, go-getting lives like we do in this country, you see. Major Ayers glared at him politely. Somewhat like the continent, he suggested after a time. Not exactly, the Semitic man said. In America, you often find an H in cased. Fairchild and Major Ayers stared at the Semitic man. As well as a cast and chaste, Mark Frost put in. Fairchild and Major Ayers now stared at him, watching him while he lit a fresh cigarette from the stub of his present one, and left his chair and went to lie at full length on the deck. Why not? The Semitic man took him up. Love itself is stone blind. It has to be, Mark Frost answered. Major Ayers stared from one to the other for a while. He said, This Mandeville now. It is a convention, eh? A local convention? Convention, Fairchild repeated. I mean like our Gretna Green. You ask a lady there and immediately there's an understanding. Saves unnecessary explanations and all that. I thought Gretna Green was the place where they used to go to get marriage licenses in a hurry, Fairchild said suspiciously. It was once, Major Ayers agreed. But during the Great Fire, all the registrars and parsons' homes were destroyed. And in those days, communication was so poor that word didn't get about until a fortnight or so later. In the meantime, quite a few young people had gone there in all sincerity, you know, and were forced to return the next day without benefit of clergy. Of course, young ladies durst not tell until matters were remedied, which during those unsettled times might be any time up to a month or so. But by that time, of course, the police had heard of it. London police always hear of things in time, you know. And so, when you go to Gretna Green now, you get a policeman, the Semitic man said. You've Yokohama in mind, Major Ayers answered as gravely. Of course, they are native policemen, he added. Like whitebait, the Semitic man suggested. Or sardines, Mark Frost corrected. Or sardines, Major Ayers agreed suavely. He sucked violently at his cold pipe while Fairchild stared at him with intrigued bewilderment. But this young lady, the one who popped off with the steward and came back the same day, is this customary with your young girls? I ask for information, he added quickly. Our young girls don't do that, you know. With us, only decayed countesses do that cut off to Italy with chauffeurs and second footmen, and they never return before nightfall. But our young girls... Art, the Semitic man explained succinctly. Mark Frost elaborated. In Europe, being an artist is a form of behavior. In America, it's an excuse for a form of behavior. 
Yes, but I say, Major Ayers mused again, sucking violently at his cold pipe. Then, she's not the one who did that tweaky little book, is she? The syphilis book? No, that was Julius's sister, the one named Eva, Fairchild said. This one that eloped and came back ain't an artist at all. It's just the artistic atmosphere of the boat, I guess. Oh, said Major Ayers. Strange, he remarked. He rose and thumped his pipe against his palm. Then he blew through the stem and put it in his pocket. I think I shall go below and have a whiskey. Who will come along? I guess I won't right now, Fairchild decided. The Semitic man said later on. Major Ayers turned to the prone poet. And you, old thing? Bring it up to us, Mark Frost suggested. But Fairchild vetoed this. The Semitic man supported him, and Major Ayers departed. I wish I had a drink, Mark Frost said. Go down and have one, then, Fairchild told him. The poet groaned. The Semitic man lighted his cigar again, and Fairchild spoke from his tentative bewilderment. That was interesting about Gretna Green, wasn't it? I didn't know about that. Never read it anywhere, I mean. But I guess there's lots of grand things in the annals of all people that never get into the history books. The Semitic man chuckled. Fairchild tried to see his face in the obscurity. Then he said, Englishmen are funny folks, always kidding you at the wrong time. Things just on the verge of probability, and just when you have made up your mind to take it one way, you find they meant it the other. He mused a while in the darkness. It was kind of nice, wasn't it? Young people, young men and girls, caught in that strange hushed magic of sex and the mystery of intimate clothing and functions and all, and of lying side by side in the darkness, telling each other things. That's the charm of virginity, telling each other things. Virginity don't make any difference as far as the body's concerned. Young people running away together in a flurry of secrecy and caution and desire and getting there to find... Again, he turned his kind, baffled face toward his friend. He continued after a while. Of course, the girls would be persuaded after they'd come that far, wouldn't they? You know, strange surroundings, a strange room like an island in an uncharted sea full of monsters like landlords and strangers and such. The sheer business of getting their bodies from place to place and feeding them and caring for them and your young man thwarted and lustful and probably fearful that you'd change your mind and back out altogether, and a strange room all secret and locked and far away from familiar things, and you young and soft and nice to look at and knowing it too, of course they'd be persuaded. And of course when they got back home they wouldn't tell, not until another parson turned up and everything was all regular again, and maybe not then. Maybe they'd whisper to a friend some day after they'd been married long enough to prefer talking to other women to talking to their husbands while they were discussing the things women talk about. But they wouldn't tell the young unmarried ones, though. And if they, even a year later, ever got wind of another one being seen going there or coming away, they are such practical creatures, you know. Only men hold to conventions for moral reasons. Or from habit, the Semitic man added. Yes, Fairchild agreed. I wonder what became of Gordon. Jenny remarked his legs, tweeted. How can he stand them heavy clothes in this weather, she thought, with placid wonder, calling him soundlessly as he passed. His purposeful stride faltered and he came over beside her. Enjoying the evening, eh? he suggested affably, glaring down at her in the darkness. Inside her borrowed clothes she was rife as whipped cream, blonde and perishable as an expensive pastry. Kind of, she admitted. Major Ayers leaned his elbow on the rail. I was on my way below, he told her. Yes, sir, Jenny agreed, passive in the darkness, like an erotic lightning bug projecting that sense of himself, surrounded and closed by the sweet, cloudy fire of her thighs, as young girls will. Major Ayers looked down at her vague, soft head. Then he jerked his head sharply, glaring about. Enjoying the evening, eh? he asked again. Yes, sir, Jenny repeated. She bloomed like a cloying, heavy flower. Major Ayers moved restively. 
Again he jerked his head as if he had heard his name spoken. Then he looked at Jenny again. Are you a native of New Orleans? Yes, sir. Esplanade. I beg pardon? Esplanade, where I live in New Orleans, she explained. It's a street, she added after a while. Oh, Major Ayers murmured. Do you like living there? I don't know. I always lived there. After a time, she added. It's not far. Not far, eh? No, sir. She stood motionless beside him, and for the third time Major Ayers jerked his head quickly, as though someone were trying to attract his attention. I was on my way below, he repeated. Jenny waited a while, then she murmured, It's a fine night for courting. Courting? Major Ayers repeated. With dates, Major Ayers stared down upon her hushed, soft hair. When boys come to see you, she explained, when you go out with the boys. Go out with the boys, Major Ayers repeated. To Mandeville, perhaps? Sometimes, she agreed. I've been there. Do you go often? Why, sometimes, she repeated. With boys, eh? With men, too, hey? Yes, sir, Jenny answered with mild surprise. I don't guess anybody would just go there by herself. Major Ayers calculated heavily. Jenny stood docile and rife, projecting her little enticing aura, doing her best. I say, he whispered presently, suppose we pop down there tomorrow, you and I. Tomorrow, Jenny repeated with soft astonishment. Tonight, then, he amended. What do you say? Tonight? Can we get there tonight? It's kind of late, ain't it? How will we get there? Like those people who went off this morning did. There's a tram or bus, isn't there? Or a train at the nearest village? I don't know. They came back in a boat. Oh, a boat. Major Ayers considered a moment. Well, no matter. We'll wait until tomorrow, then. We'll go tomorrow, eh? Yes, sir, Jenny repeated tirelessly, passive and rife, projecting her emanation. Once more, Major Ayers looked about him. Then he moved his hand from the rail, and as Jenny, seeing the movement, turned to him with a slow unreluctance, he chucked her under the chin. Right then, he said briskly, moving away. Tomorrow it is. Jenny gazed after him in passive astonishment, and he turned and came back to her, and giving her an intimate, inviting glare, he chucked her again under her soft, surprised chin. Then he departed permanently. Jenny gazed after his tweed-clad dissolving shape, watching him out of sight. He sure is a foreigner, she told herself. She sighed. End of section 41, read by Bryce Cries. Section 42 of Mosquitoes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mosquitoes by William Faulkner. Third day, 9 p.m., continued. The water lapped at the hull of the yacht with little sounds, little hushed sounds like boneless hands might make, and she leaned again over the rail, gazing downward into the dark water. He would be refined as anybody, she mused to herself, being her brother, more refined, because she had been away all day with that waiter in the dining room. But maybe the waiter was refined too, except I never found many boys that. I guess her aunt must have jumped on her. I wonder what she'd uh, done when they come back, if we'd got that boat started and went away. And now that red-headed man, and she says he's drowned. Jenny gazed into the dark water, thinking of death, of being helpless in that terrible suffocating resilience of water, feeling again that utter and dreadful helpfulness of terror and fear. So when Mr. Taliaferro was suddenly and silently beside her, touching her, she recognized him by instinct and feeling again her world become unstable and shifting beneath her, feeling all familiar solid things fall away from under her, and seeing familiar faces and objects are swooping away from her as she plunged from glaring sunlight through a timeless interval into fear, like a green lambent straying to receive her, 
She was stark and tranced, but at last she could move again, screaming. You scared me so bad, she gasped piteously, shrinking from him. She turned and ran, ran toward light, toward the security of walls. The room was dark, no sound within it, and after the dim spaciousness of the deck it seemed close and hot. But here were comfortable walls, and Jenny snapped on the light and entered, entered into an atmosphere of familiarity. Here was a vague ghost of the scent she liked, and with which she had happily been impregnated when she came aboard, and which had not yet completely died away, and the thin sharp odor of lilacs which she had come to associate with Mrs. Wiseman, and which lingered also in the room, and the other's clothing, and her own comb on the dressing table, and the bright metal cylinder of her lipstick beside it. Jenny looked at her face in the mirror for a while, then she removed a garment and returned to gaze at her stainless pink and whiteness, ineffable, unmarred by any thought at all. Then she removed the rest of her clothes, and again before the glass she passed her comb through the drowsing miniature Golconda of her hair, then she got her naked body placidly into bed, as was her habit since three nights. But she didn't turn out the light. She lay in her berth, gazing up at the smug glare of light upon the painted, unbroken sweep of the ceiling. Time passed while she lay rosy and motionless, measured away by the small boneless hands of water lapping against the hall beyond the port, and she could hear feet also and people moving about and making sounds. She didn't know what it was she wanted, except it was something. So she lay on her back, rosy and quiet, beneath the unshaded glare of the inadequate light, and after a while she thought that maybe she was going to cry. Maybe that was it. So she lay naked and rosy and passive on her back, waiting to begin. She could hear people moving about, voices and feet, and she kept waiting for that first taste of crying that comes into your throat before you really get started. That feeling that there are two little salty canals just under your ears when you feel sorry for yourself, and the other kind of feeling you have at the base of your nose. Only my nose don't get red when I cry, she thought, in a placid, imminent misery of sadness and meaningless despair, waiting passive and still and without dread for it to begin. But before it began, Mrs. Wiseman entered the room. She came over to Jenny, and Jenny looked up and saw the other's dark, small head, like a deer's head, against the light, and that dark, intent way the other had of looking at her. And presently Mrs. Wiseman said, What is it, Jenny? What's the matter? But she had forgotten what it was, almost. All she could remember was that there had been something, but now that the other had come, Jenny could hardly remember that she had forgotten anything, even and so she just lay and looked up at the other's dark, slender head against the unshaded light. Poor child, you have had a hard day, haven't you? She put her hand on Jenny's brow, smoothing back the fine, hushed gold of Jenny's hair, stroking her hand along Jenny's cheek. Jenny lay quiet under the hand, drowsing her eyes like a stroked kitten, and then she knew she could cry all right whenever she wanted to. Only it was almost as much fun just lying here and knowing you could cry whenever you got ready to as the crying itself would be. She opened her blue ineffable eyes. Do you suppose he's really drowned? she asked. Mrs. Wiseman's hand stroked Jenny's cheek, pushing her hair upward and away from her brow. I don't know, darling, she answered soberly. He's a luckless man, and anything may happen to a luckless man. But don't you think about that any more, do you hear? She leaned her face down to Jenny's. Do you hear, she said again. No, Fairchild said. He ain't the sort to get drowned. Some people just ain't that sort. I wonder, he broke off suddenly and gazed at his companions. Say, do you suppose he went off because he thought that girl was gone for good? Drowned himself for love, Mark Frost said. Not in this day and time. People suicide because of money and disease, not for love. I don't know about that, Fairchild objected. They used to die because of love, and human nature don't change. Its actions achieve different results under different conditions, but human nature don't change. Mark is right, the Semitic man said. 
People in the old books died of heartbreak also, which was probably merely some ailment that any modern surgeon or veterinarian could cure out of hand. But people did not die of love. That's the reason love and death in conjunction have such an undying appeal in books. They're never very closely associated anywhere else. But as for a broken heart in this day of general literacy and facilities for disseminating the printed word, he made a sound of disparagement. Lucky he who believes that his heart is broken, he can immediately write a book and so take revenge. What is more terrible than the knowledge that the man you have just knocked down discovered a coin in the gutter while getting up on him or her who damaged his or her ventricles? Besides cleaning up in the movies and magazines, no, no, he repeated, you don't commit suicide when you are disappointed in love. You write a book. I don't know about that, repeated Fairchild stubbornly. People will do anything. But I suppose it takes a fool to believe that and act on that principle. Beyond the eastern horizon was a rumor of pale silver, pallid and chill and faint, and they sat for a while in silence, thinking of love and death. The red eye of a cigarette twelve inches from the deck. This was Mark Frost. Fairchild broke the silence. The way she went off with uh, the steward, it was kind of nice, wasn't it? And came back. No excuses, no explanations. Think no evil, you know. That's what these post-war young folks have taught us. Only old folks like Julius and me would ever see evil in what people, young people, do. But then I guess folks growing up into the manner of looking at life that we inherited would find evil in anything where inclination wasn't subservient to duty. We were taught to believe that duty is infallible, or it wouldn't be duty. And if it were just unpleasant enough, you get a mark in heaven, sure. But maybe it ain't so different taken one generation by another. Most of our sins are vicarious anyhow. I guess when you are young you have too much fun just being to sin very much, but it's kind of nice being young in this generation. Surely we all think that when our arteries begin to harden, the Semitic man rejoined. Not only are most of our sins vicarious, but most of our pleasures are too. Look at our books, our stage, the movies. Who supports them? Not the young folks. They'd rather walk around or just sit and hold each other's hands. It's a substitute, Fairchild said. Don't you see? Substitute for what? When you are young and in love yesterday and out today and in again tomorrow, do you know anything about love? Is it anything to you except a rather dreadful mixture of jealousy and thwarted desires and interference with that man's world, which, after all, we all prefer? and nagging and maybe a little pleasure like a drug? It's not the women you sleep with that you remember, you know. No, thank God, Fairchild said. The other continued. It's the old problem of the aristocracy over and over, a natural envy of that minority which is at liberty to commit all the sins which the majority cannot stop earning a living long enough to commit. He lit his cigar again. Young people always shape their lives as the preceding generation requires of them. I don't mean exactly that they go to church when they are told to, for instance, because their elders expect it of them, though God only knows what other reason they could possibly have for going to church as it is conducted nowadays, with a warden to patrol the building in the urban localities and in the rural districts, squads of KKKs beating the surrounding copses, and all those traditional retreats that in the olden days enabled the church to produce a soul for every one it saved. But youth in general lives unquestioningly according to the arbitrary precepts of its elders. For instance, a generation ago, higher education was not considered so essential, and young people grew up at home into the convention that the thing to do was to get married at 21 and go to work immediately regardless of one's equipment or inclination or aptitude. But now they grow up into the convention that youth, that being under 30 years of age, is a protracted sophomore course without lectures in which one must spend one's entire time dressed like a caricature, drinking homemade booze and pawing at the opposite sex in the intervals of being arrested by traffic policemen. A few years ago, a so-called commercial artist, 
grown, damn you, named John Held, began to caricature college life, cloistered and otherwise, in the magazines. Ever since then, college life, cloistered and otherwise, has been busy caricaturing John Held. It is expected of them by their elders, you see, and the young people humor them. Young people are far more tolerant of the inexplicable and dangerous vagaries of their elders than the elders ever were or ever will be of the natural and harmless foibles of their children. But perhaps they both enjoy it. I don't know, Fairchild said. Not even the old folks would like to be surrounded by people making such a drama of existence, and the young folks wouldn't like it either. Young people have so many other things to do, you know, I think. His voice ceased, died into darkness, and a faint lapping sound of water. The moon had swum up out of the east again, that waning moon of decay, worn and affable and cold. It was a magic on the water, a magic of pallid and fleshless things. The red eye of Mark Frost's cigarette arced slow and lateral in his invisible hand, returned to its station twelve inches above the deck, and glowed and faded like a pulse. You see, Fairchild added like an apology, I believe in young love in the spring and things like that. I guess I'm a hopeless sentimentalist. The Semitic man grunted. Mark Frost said, Virtue through abjectness and falsification, immolation of insincerity. Fairchild ignored him, wrapped in this dream of his own. When the youth goes out of you, you get out of it. Out of life, I mean. Up to that time, you just live. After that, you are aware of living, and living becomes a conscious process. Like thinking does in time, you know. You become conscious of thinking, and then you start right off to think in words. And first thing you know, you don't have thoughts in your mind at all. You just have words in it. But when you are young, you just be. Then you reach a stage where you do. Then a stage where you think, and last of all, where you remember, or try to. Sex and death, said Mark Frost sepulchrally, arcing the red eye of his cigarette. A blank wall on which sex casts a shadow, and the shadow is life. The Semitic man grunted again, immersed in one of his rare periods of uncommunicativeness. The moon climbed higher, the pallid, unmuscled belly of the moon, and the Nausicaa dreamed like a silver gull on the dark, restless water. I don't know, Fairchild said again. I never found anything shadowy about life, people, least of all about my own doings. But it may be that there are shadowy people in the world, people to whom life is a kind of antic shadow. But people like that make no impression on me at all. I can't seem to get them at all. But this may be because I have a kind of firm belief that life is all right. Mark Frost had cast away his final cigarette and was now a long, prone shadow. The Semitic man was motionless also, holding his dead cigar. I was spending the summer with my grandfather in Indiana, in the country. I was a boy then, and it was kind of a family reunion with aunts and cousins that hadn't seen each other in years. Children, too, all sizes. There was a girl that I remember, about my age, I reckon. She had blue eyes and a lot of long, prim, golden curls. This girl, Jenny, must have looked like her when she was about 12. I didn't know the other children very well, and besides, I was used to furnishing my own diversion anyway, so I kind of just hung around and watched them doing the things children do. I didn't know how to go about getting acquainted with them. I'd seen how the other newcomers would do it, and I'd kind of planned to myself how I'd go about it, what I'd say when I went up to them. He ceased and mused for a time in a kind of hushed surprise. Just like Talia Farrow, he said at last, quietly. I hadn't thought of that before. He mused for a time, then he spoke again. I was kind of like a dog going among strange dogs. Scared, kind of, but acting haughty and aloof. But I watched them, the way she made up to them, for instance. The day after she came, she was the leader, always telling them what to do next. She had blue dresses, mostly. Mark Frost snored in the silence. The Nausicaa dreamed like a gull in the dark water. This was before the day of waterworks and sewage systems in country homes, and this one had the usual outhouse. 
It was down a path from the house. In the late summer, there were tall burdocks on either side of the path, taller than a 12-year-old boy by late August. The outhouse was a small square frame box kind of thing with a partition separating the men from the women inside. It was a hot day in the middle of the afternoon. The others were down at the orchard under the trees. From where I had been, in a big tree in the yard, I could see them, and the girls' colored dresses in the shade, and when I climbed down from the tree and went across the backyard and through the gate and along the path toward the privy, I could see them occasionally through the gaps in the burdocks. They were sitting around in the shade playing some game or maybe just talking. I went on down the path and went inside, and when I turned to shut the door to the men's side, I looked back and I saw her blue dress kind of shining coming along the path between the tall weeds. I couldn't tell if she had seen me or not, but I knew that if I went back I'd have to pass her, and I was ashamed to do this. It would have been different if I'd already been there and was coming away, or it seemed to me that it would have. Boys are that way, you know, he added, uncertainly turning his bewilderment again toward his friend. The other grunted. Mark Frost snored in his shadow. So I shut the door quick and stood right quiet, and soon I heard her enter the other side. I didn't know yet if she'd seen me, but I was going to stay quiet as I could until she went away. I just had to do that, it seemed to me. Children are much more psychic than adults. More of a child's life goes on in its mind than people believe. A child can distill the whole gamut of experiences it has never actually known into a single instant. Anthropology explains a little of it, but not much, because the gaps in human knowledge that have to be bridged by speculation are too large. The first thing a child is taught is the infallibility and necessity of precept, and by the time the child is old enough to add anything to our knowledge of the mind, it has forgotten. The soul sheds every year like snakes do, I believe. You can't recall the emotions you felt last year, you remember only that an emotion was associated with some physical fact of experience, but all you have of it now is a kind of ghost of happiness and a vague and meaningless regret. Experience, why should we be expected to learn wisdom from experience? Muscles only remember, and it takes repetition and repetition to teach a muscle anything. Arcturus, Orion swinging head downward by his knees in the southern sky, an electric lobster fading as the moon rose. Water lapped at the hull of the Nausicaa with little sounds. So I tiptoed across to the seat. It was hot in there, with the sun beating down on it. I could smell hot resin, even above the smell of the place itself. In a corner of the ceiling there was a dirt dauber's nest, a hard lump of clay with holes in it, stuck to the ceiling, and big green flies made a steady droning sound. I remember how hot it was in there, and that feeling places like that give you, a kind of letting down of the bars of pretense, you know, a kind of submerging of civilized strictures before the grand implacability of nature in the physical body. And I stood there feeling this feeling and the heat and hearing the drone of those big flies, holding my breath and listening for a sound from beyond the partition. But there wasn't any sound from beyond it, so I put my head down through the seat. Mark Frost snored. The moon, the pallid belly of the moon, inundating the world with a tarnished magic, not of living things, laying her silver fleshless hand on the water that whispered and lapped against the hull of the yacht. The Semitic man clutched his dead cigar, and he and Fairchild sat in the implacable laxing of muscles and softing tissue of their forty-odd years, seeing two wide, curious blue eyes into which an inverted surprise came clear as water, and long golden curls swinging downward above the ordure. And they sat in silence, remembering youth and love and time and death. End of section 42, read by Bryce Cries, Ohio. Section 43 of Mosquitoes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mosquitoes by William Faulkner. 
third day, 11 p.m. Mark Frost had roused and with a ghostly epigram had taken himself off to bed. Later the Semitic man rose and departed, leaving him with a cigar, and Fairchild sat with his stocking feet on the rail, puffing at the unfamiliar weed. He could see the whole deck in the pallid moonlight, and presently he remarked someone sitting near the after rail. How long this person had been there Fairchild could not have told, but he was there now, alone and quite motionless, and there was something about his attitude that unleashed Fairchild's curiosity, and at last he rose from his chair. It was David the steward. He sat on a coiled rope, and he held something in his hands between his knees. When Fairchild stopped beside him, David raised his head slowly into the moonlight and gazed at the older man, making no effort to conceal that which he held. Fairchild leaned nearer to see. It was a slipper, a single slipper, cracked and stained with dried mud and disreputable, yet seeming still to hold in its mute shape something of that hard and sexless graveness of hers. After a while, David looked away, gazing again out across the dark water and its path of shifting silver, holding the slipper between his hands, and without speaking, Fairchild turned and went quietly away. End of section 43, read by Bryce Cries, Ohio. Section 44 of Mosquitoes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michael Fascio. Mosquitoes by William Faulkner. The fourth day, seven o'clock. Fairchild waked and lay for a while luxuriously on his back. After a time, he turned on his side to doze again and when he turned he noticed the square of paper lying on the floor as though it had been thrust under the door. He lay watching it for a while, and then he came fully awake, and he rose and crossed the room and picked it up. Dear Mr. Fairchild, I am leaving the boat today. I have got a better job. I have got two days coming to me. I will not claim it. I am leaving the boat before the trip is over. Tell Mrs. Moore I have got a better job. Ask her she will pay you five dollars. Of it you loaned me yours truly, David West. He reread the note, brooding over it, then he folded it and put it in the pocket of his pajama jacket and poured himself a drink. The Semitic man in his berth snored, profound, defenseless on his back. Fairchild sat again in his berth, his drink untasted beside him, and he unfolded the note and read it through again, remembering youth, thinking of age and slackening flesh like an old thin sorrow everywhere in the world. End of section 44. Section 45 of Mosquitoes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michael Fascio. Mosquitoes by William Faulkner. The fourth day, 8 o'clock. Now don't you worry at all. They reassured Mrs. Morier. We can do just as we did yesterday. It will be more fun than ever that way. Dorothy and I can open cans and warm things. We can get along just as well without a steward as with one, can't we, Dorothy? It will be like a picnic, Mrs. Jameson agreed. Of course the men will have to help, too, she added, looking at Pete with her pale, humorless eyes. Mrs. Morier submitted dogging them with her moaning fatuousness, while Mrs. Wiseman and Miss Jameson and their niece opened cans and heated things, smearing dreadfully about the galley with grease and juices and blood from the niece's thumb, opening, at Mark Frost's instigation, a can labeled beans, which turned out to be green string beans. But they got coffee made at last, and breakfast was finally not very late. As they had said, it was like a picnic, though there were no ants as the Semitic man pointed out just before he was ejected from the kitchen. "'We'll open a can of them for you,' his sister offered briskly. Besides, there was still plenty of grapefruit. At breakfast. 
Fairchild. But I saw him after we got back to the yacht. I know I did. Mark. No, he wasn't in the boat when we came back. I remember now. I never saw him after we changed places, just after Jenny and Ernest fell out. Julius. That's so... Was he in the boat with us at all? Does anybody remember seeing him in the boat at all? Fairchild. Sure he was. Don't you remember how Mark kept hitting him with his oar? I tell you I saw... Mark. He was in the boat at first, but after Jenny and... Fairchild. Sure he was. Don't you remember seeing him after we came back, Eva? Eva. I don't know. My back was toward all of you while we were rowing. And after Ernest threw Jenny out, I don't remember who was there and who wasn't. Fairchild. Talia Farrow was facing us. Didn't you see him, Talia Farrow? And Jenny. Jenny ought to remember. Don't you remember seeing him, Jenny? Mr. Talia Farrow. I was watching the rope, you know. Fairchild. How about you, Jenny? Don't you remember? Eva. Now don't you bother Jenny about it. How could she be expected to remember anything about it? How could anybody be expected to remember anything about such an idiotic, idiotic Fairchild? Well, I do. Don't you all remember him going below with us after we got back? Mrs. Morier, wringing her hands. Doesn't someone remember something about it? It's terrible. I don't know what to do. You people don't seem to realize what a position it puts me in with such a dreadful thing hanging over me. You people have nothing to lose, but I live here. I have a certain... I know a thing like this. Fairchild. Ah, oh, he ain't drowned. He'll turn up soon. You watch what I say. The niece. And if he is drowned, we'll find him all right. The water isn't very deep between here and the shore. Her aunt gazed at her dreadfully. The nephew. Besides, the dead body always floats after 48 hours. All we have to do is wait right here until tomorrow morning. Chances are he'll be bumping alongside, ready to be hauled back on board. Mrs. Morier screamed. Her scream shuddered and died among her chins, and she gazed about at her party in abject despair. Fairchild. Ah, he ain't drowned. I tell you I saw. The niece. Sure. Cheer up, Aunt Pat. We'll get him back, even if he is. It's not like losing him altogether, you know. And if you send his body back, maybe his folks won't even claim your boat or anything. Eva. Shut up, you children. Fairchild. But I tell you I saw. End of section 45. Section 46 of Mosquitoes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michael Fascio. Mosquitoes by William Faulkner. Fourth day. Nine o'clock. Forward. Jenny, the niece, her brother, come temporarily out of his scientific shell, and Pete stood in a group. Pete in his straw hat and the nephew with his lean young body and the two girls in their little scanty dresses, and awkward with a sort of terrible grace. So flagrantly young they were that it served as a barrier between them and the others, causing even Mr. Taliaferro to lurk nearby without the courage to join them. These young girls, Fairchild said, he watched the group, watched the niece and Jenny as they clung to the rail and swung aimlessly back and forth, pivoting on their heels, in a sheer wantonness of young muscles. They scare me, he admitted. Not as a possible or probable chastity, you know. Chastity ain't... A bodiless illusion multiplied by lack of opportunity, Mark Frost said. What? he asked, looking at the poet. Well, maybe so. He resumed his own tenuous thought. Maybe we all have different ideas of sex, like all races do. Maybe us three sitting here are racially unrelated to each other as regards sex, like a Frenchman, an Anglo-Saxon, and a Mongol, for instance. Sex, said the Semitic man, to an Italian is something like a firecracker at a children's party. To a Frenchman, a business, the relaxation from which is making money. To an Englishman, it is a nuisance. To an American, a horse race. Now, which are you? Fairchild laughed. He watched the group forward a while. 
They're strange sexless shapes, you know, he went on. We, you and I, grew up expecting something beneath a woman's dress. Something satisfying in the way of breasts and hips and such. But now... Do you remember the pictures you used to get in packages of cigarettes, or that you saw in magazines and barbershops? Anna Held and Eva Tangway with shapes like elegant parlor lamp chimneys? Where are they now? Now on the street, what do you see? Creatures with the uncomplex awkwardness of calves or colts, with two little knobs for breasts and indicated buttocks that, except for their soft look, might well belong to a boy of fifteen. Not satisfying any more, just exciting and monotonous, and mostly monotonous. Where, he continued, are the soft, bulging, rabbit-like things women used to have inside their clothes? Gone, with a poor Indian and ten-cent beer and cambric drawers. But still, they're kind of nice, these young girls. Kind of like a thin, monotonous flute music or something. Shrill and stupid, the Semitic man agreed. He, too, gazed at the group forward for a time. Who was the fool who said that our clothing, our custom and dress, does not affect the shape of our bodies and our behavior? Not stupid, the other objected. Women are never stupid. Their mental equipment is too sublimely sufficient to do what little directing their bodies require. And when your mentality is sufficient to your bodily needs, where there is such a perfect mating of capability and necessity, there can't be any stupidity. When women have more intelligence than that, they become nuisances sooner or later. All they need is enough intelligence to move and eat and observe the cardinal precautions of existence, and recognize the current mode in time to standardize themselves, Mark Frost put in. Well, yes, and I don't object to that either, Fairchild said. As a purely lay brother to the human race, I mean. After all, they are merely articulated genital organs with a kind of aptitude for spending whatever money you have. So when they get themselves up to look exactly like all the other ones, you can give all your attention to their bodies. What about the exceptions? Mark Frost asked. The ones that don't paint or bob their hair. Poor things, Fairchild answered. And the Semitic man said, Perhaps there is heaven after all. You believe they have souls, then? Fairchild asked. Certainly. If they are not born with them, it's a poor creature indeed who can't get one from some man by the time she's eleven years old. That's right, Fairchild agreed. He watched the group forward for a time. Then he rose. I think I'll go over and hear what they're talking about. Mrs. Wiseman came up and borrowed a cigarette of Mark Frost, and they watched Fairchild's burly retreating back. The Semitic man said, There's a man of undoubted talent, despite his fumbling bewilderment in the presence of sophisticated emotions. Despite his lack of self-assurance, you mean, Mark Frost corrected. No, it isn't that, Mrs. Wiseman put in. You mean the same thing that Julius does, that having been born an American of a provincial Midwestern lower middle class family, he has inherited all the lower middle class's awe of education with a capital E, an awe which the very fact of his difficulty in getting to college and staying there has increased. Yes, her brother agreed. And the reaction which sheer accumulated years and human experience has brought about in him has swung him to the opposite extreme without destroying that ingrained awe or offering him anything to replace it with at all. His writing seems fumbling, not because life is unclear to him, but because of his innate humorless belief that, though it bewilder him at times, life at bottom is sound and admirable and fine. And because, hovering over this American scene into which he has been thrust, the ghosts of the Emersons and Lowells and other exemplifiers of education with a capital E, who, seated on chairs in handsomely carpeted parlors, and surrounded by an atmosphere of half-calf and security, dominated American letters in its most healthy American phrase, without heat or vulgarity, simper yet in a sort of ubiquitous watchfulness, a sort of puerile bravado and flouting while he fears, he explained. But, his sister said, for a man like Dawson there is no better American tradition than theirs, if he but knew it. They may have sat among their objects, transcribing their Greek and Latin and holding correspondences across the Atlantic, 
but they still found time to put out of their New England ports with the word of God in one hand and a belaying pin in the other, and all sails drawing aloft. And whatever they fell foul of was American. And it was American, and is yet. Yes, her brother agreed again. But he lacks what they had at command among their shelves of discreet books and their dearth of heat and vulgarity, a standard of literature that is international. No, not a standard exactly, a belief, a conviction that his talent need not be restricted to delineating things which his conscious mind assures him are American reactions. Freedom, suggested Mark Frost hollowly. No, no one needs freedom. We cannot bear it. He need only let himself go, let himself forget all this fetich of culture and education, which is upbringing and the ghosts of those whom circumstance permitted to reside longer at college than himself, and whom, despite himself, he regards with awe, assure him that he lacks. For by getting himself and his own bewilderment and inhibitions out of the way, by describing, in a manner that even translation cannot injure, as Balzac did, American life as American life is, it will become eternal and timeless despite him. Life everywhere is the same, you know. Manners of living, it may be different. Are they not different between adjoining villages? Family names, profits on a single field or orchard, work influences. But man's old compulsions, duty and inclination, the axis and the circumference of his squirrel cage, they do not change. Details don't matter. Details only entertain us, and nothing that merely entertains us can matter, because the things that entertain us are purely speculative. Prospective pleasures which we probably will not achieve. The other things only surprise us, and he who has stood the surprise of birth can stand anything. End of section 46《Section 47 of Mosquitoes》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michael Fascio. Mosquitoes》by William Faulkner Fourth Day Ten o'clock "'Gabriel's pants,' the nephew said, raising his head. "'I've already told you once what I'm making, haven't I?' He had repaired to his retreat in the lee of the wheelhouse, where he would be less liable to interruption. Or so he thought. Jenny stood beside his chair and looked at him placidly. "'I wasn't going to ask you again,' she replied without rancor. "'I just happened to be walking by here.' Then she examined the visible deck space with a brief comprehensive glance. "'This is a fine place for courting,' she remarked. "'Is, huh?' the nephew said. What's the matter with Pete? His knife ceased and he raised his head again. Jenny answered something vaguely. She moved her head again and stood without exactly looking at him, placid and rife, giving him to think of himself surrounded and closed by the sweet cloudy fire of her thighs, as young girls do. The nephew laid his pipe and his knife aside. Where am I going to sit? Jenny asked. So he moved over in his canvas chair, making room, and she came with slow unreluctance and squirmed into the sagging chair. It's a kind of tight fit, she remarked. Presently the nephew raised his head. You don't put much pep into your petting, he remarked. So Jenny placidly put more pep into it. After a time the nephew raised his head and gazed out over the water. Gabriel's pants, he murmured in a tone of hushed detachment, "'stroking his hand slowly over the placid points of Jenny's thighs. "'Gabriel's pants.' "'After a while he raised his head. "'Say,' he said abruptly, "'where's Pete?' "'Back yonder somewheres,' Jenny answered. "'I saw him just before you stopped me.' "'The nephew craned his neck, looking aft along the deck. "'Then he uncraned it, and after a while he raised his head.' I guess that's enough, he said. He pushed at Jenny's blonde abandon. Get up now. I got my work to do. Beat it now. Give me time to, Jenny said placidly, struggling out of the chair. It was a kind of tight fit, but she stood erect finally, smoothing at her clothes. 
the nephew resumed his tools, and so after a while Jenny went away. End of section 47《Section 48 of Mosquitoes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michael Fascio. Mosquitoes by William Faulkner. Fourth Day, 11 a.m. It was a thin volume bound in dark blue boards and a narrow orange arabesque of esoteric design, unbroken across front and back near the top, and the title in orange, Satyricon in Starlight. Now here, said Fairchild, flattening a page under his hand, his heavy horn-rimmed spectacles riding his blobby, benign face jauntily, is the Major's syphilis poem. After all, poetry has accomplished something when it causes a man like the Major to mull over it for a while. Poets lack business judgment. Now if I... Perhaps that's what makes one a poet, the Semitic man suggested being able to sustain a fine obliviousness of the world and its compulsions. You're thinking of oyster fishermen, Mrs. Weissman said. Being a successful poet is being just glittering and obscure and imminent enough in your public life to excuse whatever you might do privately. If I were a poet, her child attempted. That's right, the Semitic man said. Nowadays, the gentle art has attained that state of perfection where you don't have to know anything about literature at all to be a poet. And the time is coming when you won't even have to write to be one. But that day hasn't quite arrived yet. You still have to write something occasionally. Not very often, of course, but still occasionally. And if it's obscure enough, everyone is satisfied. Then you have vindicated yourself and are immediately forgotten, and are again at perfect liberty to dine with whoever will invite you. But listen, repeated Fairchild. If I were a poet, you know what I'd do? I'd... You'd capture an unattached but ardent wealthy female. Or lacking that, some other and more fortunate poet would divide a weekend or so with you. There seems to be a noblesse oblige among them, the other answered. Gentlemen poets, that is, he added. No, said Fairchild, indefatigable. I'd intersperse my book with photographs and art studies on ineffable morons in bathing suits or clutching imitation lace window curtains across their middles. That's what I'd do. That would damn it as art, Mark Frost objected. You're confusing art with studio life, Mark, Mrs. Weissman told him. She forestalled him and accepted a cigarette. I'm all out myself. Sorry, thanks. Why not, Mark Frost responded. If studio life costs you enough, it becomes art. You have to have a good reason to give it to your people back home in Ohio or Indiana or somewhere. But everybody wasn't born in the Ohio Valley, thank God, the Semitic man said. Fairchild stared at him, kind and puzzled, a trifle belligerent. I speak for those of us who read books instead of write them, he explained. It's bad enough to grow into the conviction after you reach the age of discretion that you are to spend the rest of your life writing books, but to have your very infancy darkened by the possibility that you may have to write the great American novel. Oh, Fairchild said, well, maybe you are like me and prefer a live poet to the writings of any man. Make it a dead poet, and I'll agree. Well, he settled his spectacles. Listen to this. Mark Frost groaned, rising, and departed. Fairchild read implacably. On rose and peach their droppings bled. Love a sacrifice has lain. Beneath his hand his mouth is slain. Beneath his hand his mouth is dead. No, wait. He skipped back up the page. Mrs. Wiseman listened restively, her brother with his customary quizzical phlegm. The raven bleak and philomel, amid the bleeding trees were fixed, his hoarse cry and hers were mixed, and through the dark their droppings fell. Upon the red erupted rose, upon the broken branch of peach, blurred with scented mouths, that each to another sing and close. He read the entire poem through. What do you make of it? he asked. Mostly words, the Semitic man answered promptly. A sort of cocktail of words. I imagine you get quite a jolt from it, 
if your taste is educated to cocktails. Well, why not? Mrs. Weissman said with a fierce protectiveness. Only fools require ideas in verse. Perhaps so, her brother admitted. But there's no nourishment in electricity, as you poets nowadays seem to believe. Well, what would you have them write about, then? She demanded. There's only one possible subject to write anything about. What is there worth the effort and despair of writing about, except love and death? That's the feminine of it. You'd better let art alone and stick to artists, as is your nature. But women have done some good things, Fairchild objected. I've read. They bear geniuses. But do you think they care anything about the pictures and music their children produce? That they have any other emotion than a fierce tolerance of the vagaries of the child? Do you think Shakespeare's mother was any prouder of him than, say, Tom O'Bedlam's? Certainly she was, Mrs. Weissman said. Shakespeare made money. You made a bad choice for comparison, Fairchild said. All artists are kind of insane, don't you think so? He asked Mrs. Weissman. Yes, she snapped. Almost as insane as the ones that sit around and talk about them. Well, Fairchild stared again at the page under his hand. He said slowly, It's a kind of dark thing. It's kind of like somebody brings you to a dark door. Will you enter that room or not? But the old fellows got you in the room first, the Semitic man said. Then they asked you if you wanted to go out or not. I don't know. There are rooms, dark rooms, that they didn't know anything about at all. Freud and these other... Discovered them just in time to supply our shelterless literati with free sleeping quarters. But you and Eva just agreed that subject, substance, doesn't signify in verse. That the best poetry is just words. Yes, infatuation with words, Fairchild agreed. That's when you hammer out good poetry great poetry, a kind of singing rhythm in the world that you get into without knowing it, like a swimmer gets into a current. Words. I had it once. Shut up, Dawson, Mrs. Weissman said. Julius can afford to be a fool. Words, repeated Fairchild. But it's gone out of me now, that first infatuation, I mean, that sheer infatuation with and marveling over the beauty and power of words. That has gone out of me used up, I guess. So I can't write poetry anymore. It takes me too long to say things now. We all wrote poetry when we were young, the Semitic man said. Some of us even put it down on paper, but all of us wrote it. Yes, repeated Fairchild, turning slowly onward through the volume. Listen. O spring, O wanton, O cruel, bearing to the curved and hungry hand of March your white unsubtle thighs, and listen, he turned onward. Mrs. Wiseman was gazing aft, where Jenny and Mr. Taliaferro had come into view and now leaned together upon the rail. The Semitic man listened with weary courtesy. Above unsapped convolvule of hills, April a bee sipping perplexed with pleasure. It's a kind of childlike faith in the efficacy of words, you see, a kind of belief that circumstance somehow will invest the veriest platitude with magic. And darn it, it does happen at times. Let it be historically or grammatically incorrect or physically impossible. Let it even be trite. There comes a time when it will be invested with a something not of this life, this world at all. It's a kind of fire, you know. He fumbled himself among words, staring at them, at the Semitic man's sad, quizzical eyes and Mrs. Wiseman's averted face. Somebody, some drug clerk or something, has shredded the tender. And do you know what I believe? I believe that he's always writing it for some woman, that he fondly believes he's stealing a march on some brute bigger or richer or handsomer than he is. I believe that every word a writing man writes is put down with the ultimate intention of impressing some woman that probably don't care anything at all for literature, as is the nature of women. Well, maybe she ain't always a flesh and blood creature. She may be only the symbol of a desire, but she is feminine. Fame is only a byproduct. Do you remember? The old boys never even bothered to sign their things. But I don't know. I suppose nobody ever knows a man's reasons for what he does. You can only generalize from results. He very seldom knows his reasons himself, the other said. And by the time he has recovered from his astonishment at the unforeseen result he got, he has forgotten what reason he once believed he had. But how can he generalize from a poem? What result does a poem have? 
you say that substance doesn't matter, has no proper place in a poem. You have, the Semitic man continued with curious speculation, the strangest habit of contradicting yourself, of fumbling around and then turning tail and beating your listener to the refutation. But God knows there is plenty of room for speculation in modern verse, fumbling too, though the poets themselves do most of this. Don't you agree, Eva? His sister answered, What? Turning upon him her dark, preoccupied gaze, he repeated the question. Fairchild interrupted in full career. The trouble with modern verse is that to comprehend it you must have recently passed through an emotional experience identical with that through which the poet himself has recently passed. The poetry of modern poets is like a pair of shoes that only those whose feet are shaped like the cobbler's feet can wear, while the old boys turned out shoes that anybody who can walk at all can wear. Like overshoes, the other suggested. Like overshoes, Fairchild agreed. But then, I ain't disparaging. Perhaps the few that the shoes fit can go a lot further than the whole herd of people shod alike go. Interesting, anyway, the Semitic man said. To reduce the spiritual progress of the race to terms of an emotional migration, aesthetic Israelites crossing unwedded a pink sea of dullness and security. What about it, Eva? Mrs. Wiseman, thinking of Jenny's soft body, came out of her dream. I think you are both not only silly but dull. She rose. I want to bum another cigarette, Dawson. He gave her one, and a match, and she left them. Fairchild turned a few pages. It's kind of difficult for me to reconcile her with his book, he said slowly. Does it strike you that way? Not so much that she wrote this, the other answered, but that she wrote anything at all, that anybody should. But there's no puzzle about the book itself. Not to me, that is. But you, straying trustfully about this park of dark and rootless trees, which Dr. Ellis and your Germans have recently thrown open to the public, you'll always be a babe in that wood, you know. Bewildered and slightly annoyed. Restive, like Escher Bonnie Pal's stallion when his master mounted him. Emotional bisexuality, Fairchild said. Yes, but you are trying to reconcile the book and the author. A book is the writer's secret life, the dark twin of a man. You can't reconcile them. And with you, when the inevitable clash comes, the author's actual self is the one that goes down. For you are of those for whom fact and fallacy gain verisimilitude by being in cold print. Perhaps so, Fairchild said with detachment, brooding again on a page. Listen. Lips that of thy weary all seem weariest, seem wearier for the curled and pallid sly, still riddle of thy secret face, and thy sick despair of its own ill-obsessed. Lay not to heart thy boy's hand to protest, that smiling leaves thy tired mouth reconcile, for swearing so keeps thee but ill beguiled, with secret joy of thine own woman's breast. Weary thy mouth with smiling, canst thou bride thyself with thee in thine own kissing slake, Thy virgin's waking doth itself deride, With sleep's sharp absence coming so awake, And near thy mouth thy twinned heart's grief doth hide, For there's no breast between, it cannot break. Hermaphroditus, he read, that's what it's about. It's a kind of dark perversion, Like a fire that don't need any fuel, That lives on its own heat. I mean, all modern verse is a kind of perversion. Like the day for healthy poetry is over and done with, that modern people were not born to write poetry any more. Other things I grant, but not poetry. Kind of like men nowadays are not masculine and lusty enough to tamper with something that borders so close to the unnatural. A kind of sterile race. Women too masculine to conceive, men too feminine to beget. He closed the book and removed his spectacles slowly. You and me, sitting here, right now, this is one of the most insidious things poetry has to combat. General education has made it too easy for everybody to have an opinion on it. On everything else, too. The only people who should be allowed an opinion on poetry should be poets. But as it is... But then all artists have to suffer it, though. Oblivion and scorn and indignation and, what is worse, the adulation of fools... And, added the Semitic man, what is still worse, talk. End of section 48.
Section 49 of Mosquitoes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michael Fascio. Mosquitoes by William Faulkner. Fourth day, 12 o'clock. You must get rather tired of bothering about it, Fairchild suggested as they descended toward lunch. There was an offshore breeze and the saloon was screened. And besides, it was near the galley. Why don't you leave it in your stateroom? Major Ayers is pretty trustworthy, I guess. It'll be all right, he replied. I've got used to it. I'd miss it, see? Yes, the other agreed. New one, eh? I've had it a while. Pete removed it, and Fairchild remarked its wanton gay band and the heavy plating of the straw. I like a Panama myself, he murmured. A soft hat. This must have cost five or six dollars, didn't it? Yeah, Pete agreed. But I guess I can look out for it. It's a nice hat the Semitic man said. Not everybody can wear a stiff straw hat, but it rather suits the shape of Pete's face, don't you think? Yes, that's so, Fairchild agreed. Pete has a kind of humorless, reckless face that a stiff hat just suits. A man with a humorless face should never wear a stiff straw hat. But then, only a humorless man would dare buy one. Pete proceeded them into the saloon. The man's intent was kindly, anyway. Funny old bird. Easy. Easy. Somebody's gutting. Anybody's. Fairchild spoke to him again with a kind of tactful persistence. Look here, there's a good place to leave it while you eat. You hadn't seen this place, I reckon. Slip it under here, see? It'll be safe as a church under here until you want it again. Look, Julius, this place was made for a stiff straw hat, wasn't it? This place was a collapsible serving table of two shelves that let shallowly into the bulkhead. It operated by a spring, and anything placed on the lower shelf would be inviolate until someone came along and lowered the shelves again. It don't bother me any, Pete said. All right, the other answered, but you might as well leave it here. It's such a grand place to leave a hat, lots better than the places in theaters. I kind of wish I had a hat to leave there, don't you, Julius? I can hold it all right, Pete said again. Sure, agreed Fairchild readily, but just try to Pete did so, and the other two watched with interest. It just fits, don't it? Why not leave it there just for a trial? I guess not. I guess I'll hold on to it, Pete decided. He took his hat again, and when he had taken his seat, he slid it into its usual place between the chair back and himself. Mrs. Mowrier was chanting. Sit down, people, in an apologetic, hopeless tone. You must excuse things. I had hoped to have lunch on deck, but with the wind blowing from the shore... They've found out where we are and that we are good to eat, so it doesn't make any difference where the wind blows from, Mrs. Weissman said, businesslike with her tray. And with the steward gone, and things so unsettled, the hostess resumed in an antistrophe, roving her unhappy gaze, and Mr. Gordon. Oh, he's all right, Fairchild said, heavily helpful, taking his seat. He'll show up all right. Don't be a fool, Aunt Pat, the niece added. What would he want to get drowned for? I'm so unlucky, Mrs. Mowrier moaned. Things, things happen to me, you see, she explained, haunted with that vision of a pale implacability of water in sodden pants, and a red beard straying amid the slanting green regions of the sea in a dreadful simulation of life. Ah, shucks, the niece protested. Ugly like he is, and so full of himself, He's got too many good reasons for getting drowned. It's the ones that don't have any excuse for it that get drowned and run down by taxis and things. But you can never tell what people will do, Mrs. Mowrier rejoined, becoming profound through the sheer disintegration of comfortable things. People will do anything. Well, if he's drowned, I guess he wanted to be, the niece said bloodlessly. He certainly can't expect us to fool around here waiting for him. I've never heard of anybody fading out without leaving a note of some kind. Did you, Jenny? Jenny sat in a soft, anticipatory dread. Did he get drowned? she asked. One day at Mandeville I saw... Into Jenny's heavenly eyes there welled momentarily a selfless emotion, temporarily pure and clean. Mrs. Wiseman looked at her, compelling her with her eyes. She said, I'll Forget about Gordon for a while. If he's drowned which I don't believe. He's drowned. If he isn't, 
he'll show up again, just as Dawson says. That's what I say, the niece supported her quickly. Only he'd better show up soon if he wants to go back with us. We've got to get back home. You have? her aunt said with a heavy, astonished irony. How are you going, pray? Perhaps her brother will make us a bow with his saw, Mark Frost suggested. That's an idea, Fairchild agreed. Say, Josh, haven't you got a tool of some sort that'll get us off again? The nephew regarded Fairchild solemnly. Whittle it off, he said. Lend you my knife if you bring it back right away. He resumed his meal. Well, we've got to get back, his sister repeated. You folks can stay around here if you want to, but me and Josh have got to get back to New Orleans. Going by Mandeville? Mark Frost asked. But the tug should be here any time, Mrs. Nowrier insisted, reverting again to her hopeless amaze. The niece gave Mark Frost a grave speculative stare. You're smart, aren't you? I've got to be, Mark Frost answered equably, or I'd have to work, huh? Takes a smart man to sponge off of Aunt Pat, don't it? Patricia, her aunt exclaimed. Well, we've got to get back. We've got to get ready to go up to New Haven next month. Her brother came again out of his dream. We have, he repeated heavily. I'm going too, she answered quickly. Hank said I could. Look here, her brother said. Are you going to follow me around all your life? I'm going to Yale, she repeated stubbornly. Hank said I could go. Hank, Fairchild repeated, watching the niece with interest. It's what she calls her father, her aunt explained. Patricia, well, you can't go, her brother answered violently. Damn if I'm going to have you tagging around behind me forever. I can't move for you. You ought to be a bill collector. I don't care. I'm going, she repeated stubbornly. Her aunt said vainly. Theodore! Well, I can't do anything for her, he complained bitterly. I can't move for her. And now she's talking about going. She worried Hank until he had to say she could go. God knows, I'd have said that too. I wouldn't want her around me all the time. Shut your goddamn mouth, his sister told him. Mrs. Mowrier chanted, Patricia, Patricia. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. What do you do up there? Fairchild asked. The niece whirled, viciously belligerent. Then she said, What did you say? I mean, what'll you do to pass the time while he's at classes and things? Are you going to take some work, too? Oh, I'll just go around with balloon pants to nightclubs and things. I won't bother him. I won't hardly see him. He's such a damn crumb. Like hell you will, her brother interrupted. You're not going, I tell you. Yes, I am. Hank said I could go. He said I could. I... Well, you won't ever see me. I'm not going to have you tagging around after me up there. Are you the only one in the world that's going up there next year? Are you the only one that'll be there? I'm not going up there to waste my time hanging around the entrance to Dwight or Osborne Hall just to see you. You won't catch me sitting on the rail of the green with freshmen. I'm going to places that maybe you'll get into in three years. If you don't bust out or something. Don't you worry about me. Who was it? She rushed on. Got invited up for prom week last year. Only Hank wouldn't let me go. Who was it saw the game last fall while you were perched up on the top row with a bunch of newspaper reporters in the rain? You didn't go up for prom week. Because Hank wouldn't let me. But I'll be there next year and you can haul out the family sock on it. Oh, shut up for a while, her brother said wearily. Maybe some of these ladies want to talk some. End of section 49. Section 50 of Mosquitoes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michael Fascio. Mosquitoes by William Faulkner. Fourth day, two o'clock. And there was the tug, squatting at her cables, breaking the southern horizon with an effect of abrupt magic, like a stereopticon slide flashed on the screen while you had turned your head for a moment. Look at that boat, said Mark Frost, broaching. Mrs. Morier, directly behind him, shrieked. It's the tug! She turned and screamed down the companionway. It's the tug! The tug has come! The others all chanted, The tug! The tug! Major Ayers exclaimed dramatically and opportunely. Ha! Gone away. 
It has come at last, Mrs. Morier shrieked. It came while we were at lunch. Has any one... She roved her eyes about. The captain. Has he been notified? Mr. Taliaferro? Surely, Mr. Taliaferro agreed with polite alacrity, mounting the stairs and disintegrating his members with expedition. I'll summon the captain. So he rushed forward, and the others came on deck and stared at the tug, and a gentle breeze blew off shore, and they slapped intermittently at their exposed surfaces. Mr. Taliaferro shouted, Captain! Oh, Captain! about the deck. He screamed it into the empty wheelhouse and returned. He must be asleep, he told them. We are off at last, Mrs. Morier intoned. We can get off at last. The tug has come. I sent for it days and days ago, but we can get off now. But the captain, where's the captain? He shouldn't be asleep this time. Of all times for the captain to be asleep. Mr. Taliaferro. But Gordon, Mark Frost said, how about... Miss Jameson clutched his arm. Let's get off first, she said. I called him, Mr. Taliaferro reminded them. He must be asleep in his room. He must be asleep, Mrs. Morier repeated. Will some gentleman... Mr. Taliaferro took his cue. I'll go, he said. If you will be so kind, Mrs. Morier screamed after him. She stared again at the tug. He should have been here, so we could be all ready to start, she said fretfully. She waved her handkerchief at the tug. It ignored her. We might be getting everything ready, though, Fairchild suggested. We ought to have everything ready when they pull us off. That's so, Mark Frost agreed. We'd better run down and pack, hadn't we? Ah, uh, we ain't going back home yet. We've just started the cruise. Are we, folks? They all looked at the hostess. She roved her stricken eyes, but she said at last, bravely, Why, no. No, of course not, if you don't want to. But the captain, we ought to be ready, she repeated. Well, let's get ready, Mrs. Wiseman said. Nobody knows anything about boats except Fairchild, Mark Frost said. Mr. Taliaferro returned, barren. Me? Fairchild repeated. Taliaferro's been across the whole ocean. And there's major airs. All Britishers cut their teeth on anchor chains and marlin spikes and draw their toys with lubber's lines, Mrs. Wiseman chanted. It's almost a poem. Finish it, someone. Mr. Taliaferro made a sound of alarm. No, really, I... Mrs. Morier turned to Fairchild. Will you assume charge until the captain appears, Mr. Fairchild? Mr. Fairchild, Mr. Taliaferro parroted, Mr. Fairchild is temporary captain, people. The captain doesn't seem to be on board he whispered to Mrs. Morier. Fairchild glanced about with a sort of ludicrous helplessness. "'What am I supposed to do?' he asked. "'Jump overboard with a shovel and shovel the sand away?' "'A man who has reiterated his superiority as much as you have for the last week should never be at a loss for what to do,' Mrs. Wiseman told him. "'We ladies have already thought of that. You are the one to think of something else.' Well, I've already thought of not jumping overboard and shoveling her off, Fairchild answered. But that don't seem to help much, does it? You ought to coil ropes or something like that, Miss Jameson suggested. That's what they were always doing on all the ships I ever read about. All right, Fairchild agreed equably. We'll coil ropes, then. Where are the ropes? That's your trouble, Mrs. Wiseman said. You're captain now. Well, we'll find some ropes and coil them, he addressed Mrs. Morier. We have your permission to coil ropes? No, really, said Mrs. Morier in her helpless, astonished voice. Isn't there something we can do? Can't we signal to them with a sheet? They may not know that this is the right boat. Oh, they know, I guess. Anyway, we'll coil ropes and be ready for them. Come on here, you men. He named over his depleted watch and herded it forward. He herded it down to his cabin and nourished it with stimulants. We may coil the right rope at that, the Semitic man suggested. 
Major Ayers ought to know something about boats. It should be in his British blood. Major Ayers didn't think so. American boats have amphibious traits that are lacking in ours, he explained. Half the voyage on land, you know, he explained tediously. Sure, Fairchild agreed. He brought his watch above again and forward, where instinct told him the rope should be. I wonder where the captain is. Surely he ain't drowned, do you reckon? I guess not, the Semitic man answered. He gets paid for this. There comes a boat. The boat came from the tug, and soon it came alongside and the captain came over the rail. A stranger followed him and they went below without haste, leaving Mrs. Morier's words like vain, unmated birds in the air. Let's get ready then, Fairchild ordered his crew. Let's tie a rope to something. So they tied a rope to something, knotting it intricately, then Major Ayers discovered that they had tied it to a winch handle, which fitted loosely into a socket, and which would probably come out quite easily, once a strain came onto the rope. So they untied it, and found something attached firmly to the deck. And they tied the rope to this, and after a while the captain and the stranger, clutching a short, evil pipe, came back on deck and stood and watched them. We've got the right rope, Fairchild told his watch in an undertone, and they knotted the rope intricately and straightened up. How's that, Cap? Fairchild asked. All right, the captain answered. Can we trouble you for a match? Fairchild gave them a match. The stranger fired his pipe and they got into the tender and departed. They hadn't got far when the one called Walter came out and called them, and they put about and returned for him. Then they went back to the tug. Fairchild's watch had ceased work, and it gazed after the tender. After a time, Fairchild said, He said that was the right rope, so I guess we can quit. So they did, and went aft to where the ladies were, and presently the tender came bobbing back across the water. It came alongside again, and a negro, sweating gently and regularly, held it steady while the one called Walter and yet another stranger got aboard bringing a rope that trailed away into the water behind them. Everyone watched with interest while Walter and his companion made the line fast in the bows, after having removed Fairchild's rope. Then Walter and his friend went below. Say, Fairchild said suddenly, do you reckon they've found our whiskey? I guess not, the Semitic man assured him. I hope not, he amended and they all returned in a body to stare down into the tender, where the negro sat without self-consciousness, eating of a large grayish object. While they watched the negro, Walter and his companion returned, and the stranger bawled at the tug through his hands. A reply at last, and the other end of the line, which they had recently brought aboard the yacht and made fast, slid down from the deck of the tug and plopped heavily into the water, and Walter and his companion drew it aboard the yacht and coiled it down, wet and dripping. Then they elbowed themselves to the rail, cast the rope into the tender, and got in themselves, and the negro stowed his strange edible object temporarily away and rowed back to the tug. "'You guessed wrong again,' Mark Frost said with sepulchral irony. He bent and scratched his ankles. "'Try another rope.' "'You wait,' Fairchild retorted. "'Wait ten minutes, then talk. We'll be under full steam in ten minutes.' Where did that boat come from? The boat was a skiff, come when and from where they knew not, and beneath the drowsy afternoon there came faintly from somewhere up the lake the fretful sound of a motorboat engine. The skiff drew alongside, manned by a malaria-ridden man wearing a woman's dilapidated hat of black straw that lent him a vaguely bereaved air. Where's the drowned feller? he asked, grasping the rail. We don't know, Fairchild answered. We missed him somewhere between here and the shore. He extended his arm. The newcomer followed his gesture sadly. Any reward? Reward, repeated Fairchild. Reward, Mrs. Morier chimed in breathlessly. Yes, there is a reward. I offer a reward. How much? You find him first, the Semitic man put in. There will be a reward, all right. The man clung yet to the rail. 
Have you drug for him yet? No, we just started hunting, Fairchild answered. You go on and look around, and we'll get our boat and come out and help you. There'll be a reward. The man pushed his skiff clear and engaged his oars. The sound of the motor boat grew clearer steadily. Soon it came into view, with two men in it, and changed its course and bore down on the skiff. The fussy little engine ceased its racket, and it slid up to the skiff, pushing a dying ripple under its stem. The two boats clung together for a time, then they parted, and at a short distance from each other they moved slowly onward while their occupants prodded at the lake bottom with their oars. Look at them, the Semitic man said, just like buzzards. Probably be a dozen boats out there in the next hour. How do you suppose they learned about it? Lord knows, Fairchild answered. Let's get our crew and go out and help look. We'd better get the tug's men. They shouted in turn for a while, and presently one came to the rail of the tug and gazed apathetically at them, and went away. And after a while the small boat came away from the tug and crossed to them. A consultation, assisted by all hands, while the man from the tug moved unhurriedly about the business of making fast another and dirtier rope to the Nausicaa's bows. Then he and Walter went back to the tug, paying out the line behind them, while Mrs. Morier's insistence wasted itself upon the somnolent afternoon. The guests looked at one another helplessly. Then Fairchild said with determination, Come on, we'll go in our boat. He chose his men, and they gathered all the available oars and prepared to embark. Here comes the tug's boat again, Mark Frost said. They forgot and tied one end of that rope to something, Mrs. Wiseman said viciously. The boat came alongside without haste, and it and the yacht's tender lay rubbing noses, and Walter's companion asked, without interest, Where's the feller you all drowned?" I'll go along in their boat and show em, Fairchild decided. Mark Frost got back aboard the yacht with alacrity. Fairchild stopped him. You folks come on behind us in this boat. The more to hunt, the better. Mark Frost groaned and acquiesced. The others took their places, and under Fairchild's direction the two tenders retraced the course of yesterday. The first two boats were some distance ahead, moving slowly, and the tenders separated also, and the searchers pulled along, prodding with their oars at the lake floor. And such is the influence of action on the mind that soon even Fairchild's burly optimism became hushed and uncertain before the imminence of the unknown, and he, too, was accepting the possible for the probable, unaware. The sun was hazed, as though wearied of its own implacable heat, and the water, that water which might hold, soon to be revealed, the mute evidence of ultimate flouting of all man's strife, lapped and plopped at the mechanical fragilities that supported them. A small sound, monotonous and without rancor, it could well wait. They pulled slowly on. Soon the four boats, fan-wise, had traversed the course, and they turned and quartered back and forth again, slowly and in silence. Afternoon drew on, drowsing and somnolent. Yacht and tug lay motionless in a blinding shimmer of water and sun. Again the course of yesterday was covered foot by foot, patiently and silently and in vain, and the four boats, as without volition, drew nearer each other drifting closer together as sheep huddle, while water lapped and plopped beneath their hulls, sinister and untroubled by waiting. Soon the motorboat drifted up and scraped lightly along the hull in which Fairchild sat, and he raised his head, blinking against the glare. After a while, he said, Are you a ghost, or am I? I was about to ask you that, Gordon, sitting in the motorboat, replied. They sat and stared at each other. The other boats came up, and presently the one called Walter spoke. "'Is this all you wanted out here?' he asked in a tone of polite disgust, breaking the spell. "'Or do you want to row around some more?' Fairchild went immoderately into hysterical laughter. End of section 50「This is a LibriVox 
Fourth day. Four o'clock. The malarial man had attached his skiff to the fat man's motorboat, and they had puttered away in a morose dejection, rewardless. The tug had whistled a final derisive blast, showed them her squat on pretty stern, where the negro leaned, eating again of his grayish object, and, as dirty a pair of heels as it would ever be their luck to see, and sailed away. The Nasica was free once more, and she sped quickly onward, gaining offing, and the final sharp concussion of flesh and flesh died away beneath the afternoon. Mrs. Morier had gazed at him, raised her hands in a fluttering, cringing gesture, and cut him dead. "'But I saw you on the boat right after we came back,' Fairchild repeated with a sort of stubborn wonder. He opened a fresh bottle. "'You couldn't have,' Gordon answered shortly. "'I got out of the boat in the middle of Taliaferro's excitement.' He waved away the proffered glass. The Semitic man said triumphantly, I told you so, and Fairchild essayed again, stubbornly. But I saw. If you say that again, the Semitic man told him, I'll kill you. He addressed Gordon. And you thought Dawson was drowned. Yes, the man who brought me back. I stumbled on his house this morning. He had already heard of it, some way. It must have spread all up and down the lake. He didn't remember the name exactly, and when I named over the party and said Dawson Fairchild, he agreed. Dawson and Gordon, you see. And so I thought... Fairchild began to laugh again. He laughed steadily, trying to say something. And so... and so he comes back and spends... Again that hysterical note came into his laughter, and his hands trembled, clinking the bottle against the glass and sloshing a spoonful of the liquor onto the floor. And spends... He comes back, you know, and spends half a day looking, looking for his own bababad. The Semitic man rose and took the bottle and glass from him and half led, half thrust him into his bunk. You sit down and drink this. Fairchild drank the whiskey obediently. The Semitic man turned to Gordon again. What made you come back? Not just because you heard Dawson was drowned, was it? Gordon stood against the wall, mud-stained and silent. He raised his head and stared at them, and through them, with his harsh, uncomfortable stare. Fairchild touched the Semitic man's knee warningly. "'That's neither here nor there,' he said. "'The question is, shall we or shall we not get drunk? I kind of think we've got to, myself.' "'Yes,' the other agreed. "'It looks like it's up to us. Gordon ought to celebrate his resurrection, anyway.' "'No,' Gordon answered. "'I don't want any.' The Semitic man protested, but again Fairchild gripped him silent, and when Gordon turned toward the door, he rose and followed him into the passage. "'She came back, too, you know,' he said. Gordon looked down at the shorter man with his lean, bearded face, his lonely hawk's face arrogant with shyness and pride. "'I know it,' he answered. "'Your name is like a little golden bell hung in my heart. "'The man who brought me back was the same one who brought them back yesterday.' He was, said Fairchild. He's doing a land office business with deserters, ain't he? Yes, Gordon answered. And he went on down the passage with a singing lightness in his heart, a bright silver joy like wings. The deck was deserted, as on that other afternoon. But he waited patiently in the hushed happiness of his dream, and his arrogant, bitter heart was young as any yet, as forgetful of yesterday and tomorrow. And soon, as though in answer to it, she came bare-legged and molded by the wind of motion, and a grave surprise ebbed, and she thrust him a hard-tanned hand. "'So you ran away,' she said. "'And so did you,' he answered, after an interval filled with a thing all silver and clean and fine. "'That's right. We're sure the herrings on this boat, aren't we?' "'Herrings?' "'Guts, you know,' she explained. She looked at him gravely from behind the coarse, dark bang of her hair. "'But you came back,' she accused. "'And so did you,' he reminded her from amid his soundless silver wings. Five o'clock. "'But we're moving again at last,' Mrs. Morier repeated at intervals, with a detached air, listening to a sound somehow vaguely convivial that welled at intervals up the companionway. Presently Mrs. Wiseman remarked the hostess's preoccupied air, and she too ceased hearkening. 
Not again, she said with foreboding. I'm afraid so, the other answered unhappily. Mr. Taliaferro hearkened also. Perhaps I'd better... Mrs. Morier fixed him with her eye, and Mrs. Wiseman said, Poor fellows, they have had to stand a great deal in the last few days. Boys will be boys, Mr. Taliaferro added with a docile regret, listening with yearning to that vaguely convivial sound. Mrs. Morier listened to it, coldly detached and speculative. She said, But we are moving again, anyway. End of section 51《Section 52 of Mosquitoes》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio《Mosquitoes》by William Faulkner Fourth Day Six O'Clock The sun was setting across the scudding water. The water was shot goldenly with it as was the gleaming mahogany and brass elegance of the yacht, and the silver wings in his heart were touched with pink and gold while he stood and looked downward upon the coarse crown of her head, and at her body's grave and sexless replica of his own attitude against the rail, an unconscious aping both comical and heart-shaking. "'Do you know,' he asked, "'what Cyrano said once?' "'Once there was a king who possessed all things. All things were his,' power and glory and wealth and splendor and ease and so he sat at dusk in his marble court filled with the sound of water and of birds and surrounded by the fixed gesturing of palms looking out across the hushed fading domes of his city and beyond to the dreaming lilac barriers of his world no what she asked but he only looked down upon her with his cavernous uncomfortable eyes what did he say she repeated and then was he in love with her? I think so. Yes, he was in love with her. She couldn't leave him either. Couldn't go away from him at all. She couldn't? What had he done to her? Locked her up? Maybe she didn't want to, he suggested. Huh. And then, she was an awful goof then. Was he fool enough to believe she didn't want to? He didn't take any chances. He had her locked up. In a book. In a book, she repeated. Then she comprehended. Oh, that's what you've done, isn't it? With that marble girl without any arms and legs you made. Hadn't you rather have a live one? Say, you haven't got any sweetheart or anything, have you? No, he answered. How did you know? You look so bad. Shabby. But that's the reason. No woman is going to waste time on a man that's satisfied with a piece of wood or something. You ought to get out of yourself. You'll either bust all of a sudden some day or just dry up. How old are you? Thirty-six, he told her. She said, Gabriel's pants. Thirty-six years old and living in a hole with a piece of rock like a dog with a dry bone? Gabriel's pants. Why don't you get rid of it? But he only stared down at her. Give it to me, won't you? No. I'll buy it from you then. No. Give you, she looked at him with sober detachment, give you seventeen dollars for it, cash. No. She looked at him with a sort of patient exasperation. Well, what are you going to do with it? Have you got any reason for keeping it? You didn't steal it, did you? Don't tell me you haven't got any use for seventeen dollars living like you do. I bet you haven't got five dollars to your name right now. Bet you came on this party to save food. I'll give you twenty dollars, seventeen in cash. He continued to gaze at her as though he had not heard. And the king spoke to a slave crouching at his feet. Halim, Lord, I possess all things, do I not? Thou art the son of morning, Lord. Then listen, Halim, I have a desire. Twenty-five, she said, shaking his arm. No. No, 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 she hammered both brown fists on the rail. You make me so damn mad. Can't you say anything except no? You, you, she glared at him with her angry tanned face and her grave opaque eyes and used that phrase Jenny had traded her. He took her by the elbows and she became taut, still watching his face. 
He could feel the small, hard muscles in her arms. What are you going to do? she asked. He raised her from the floor, and she began to struggle. But he carried her implacably across the deck and sat on a deck chair and turned her face downward across his knees. She clawed and kicked in a silent fury, but he held her, and she ceased to struggle, and set her teeth into his leg through the gritty cloth of his trousers, and clung like a raging puppy while he drew her skirt tight across her thighs and spanked her good. "'I meant it,' she cried, raging and tearless, when he had dragged her teeth loose and set her upright on his lap. There was a small wet oval on his trousering. "'I meant it,' she repeated, taut and raging. "'I know you meant it. That's why I spanked you, not because you said it. What you said doesn't mean anything because you've got the genders backward. I spanked you because you meant it, whether you knew what to say or not.' Suddenly she became lax and wept, and he held her against his breast. But she ceased crying as abruptly, and lay quiet while he moved his hand over her face, slowly and firmly, but lightly. It is like a thing heard, not as a music of brass and plucked strings is heard in a pallid voluption of dancing girls among the strings. Nay, Halim, it is no pale virgin from tall with painted fingernails and honey and myrrh cunningly beneath her tongue, nor is it a scent as of myrrh and roses to soften and make to flow like water the pith in a man's bones, nor yet. Stay, Halim. Once I was, once I was, is not this a true thing? It is dawn in the high cold hills. Dawn is like a wind in the clean hills, and on the wind comes the thin piping of shepherds, and the smell of dawn and of almond trees on the wind. Is not that a true thing? Ay, Lord, I told thee that. I was there. Are you a petter as well as a he-man? she asked, becoming taut again and rolling upward her exposed eye. His hand moved slowly along her cheekbone and jaw, pausing, tracing a muscle, moving on. Then hark thee, Halim, I desire a thing that, had I not been at all, becoming aware of it, I would awake, that dead, remembering it, I would cling to this world, though it be as a beggar in a tattered robe. Yea, rather that would I than a king among kings amid the soft and scented sounds of paradise. Find me this, O Halim. Say, she said curiously, no longer alarmed, what are you doing that for? Learning your face. Learning my face? Are you going to make me in marble? She asked quickly, raising herself. Can you do a marble of my head? Yes. Can I have it? She thrust herself away, watching his face. Make two of them, then, she suggested. And then... If you won't do that, give me the other one, the one you've got, and I'll pose for this one without charging you anything. How about that? Maybe. I'd rather do that than have this one. Have you learned my face good? She moved again, quickly returning to her former position. She turned her face up. Learn it good. Now, this Halim was an old man, so old that he had forgotten much. He had held this king on his first pony, walking patiently beside him through the streets and paths. He had stood between the young prince and all those forms of sudden and complete annihilation which the young prince had engendered after the ingenious fashion of boys. He had got himself between the young prince and the inevitable parental admonishment which these entailed. And he sat with his gray hands on his thin knees and his gray head bent above his hands, while dusk came across the simple, immaculate domes of the city and into the court, stilling the sound of birds, so that the lilac silence of the court was teased only by the plashing of water, and on among the grave restlessness of the palms. After a while Halim spoke. Ah, Lord, in the Georgian hills I loved this maid myself when I was a lad, but that was long ago, and she is dead. She lay still against his breast while sunset died like brass horns across the water. She said again, without moving, You're a funny man. I wonder if I could sculpt. Suppose I learn your face. Well, don't, then. I'd just as soon lie still. You're a lot more comfortable to lie on than you look. Only I think you'd be getting tired now. I'm no hummingbird. Aren't you tired of holding me? 
she persisted. He moved his head at last and looked at her again with his cavernous, uncomfortable eyes, and she tried to do something with her eyes, assuming at the same time an attitude, a kind of leering invitation so palpably theatrical and false that it but served to emphasize that grave, hard sexlessness of hers. "'What are you trying to do?' he asked quietly. "'Vamp me?' She said, "'Shucks.' She sat up, then squirmed off his lap and to her feet. "'So you won't give it to me? You just won't?' "'No,' he told her soberly. She turned away, but presently she stopped again and looked back at him. "'Give you twenty-five dollars for it?' "'No,' she said shucks again, and she went on her brown, silent feet, and was gone. "'Your name is like a little golden bell hung in my heart, and when I think of you—' The nausea sped on. It was twilight abruptly. Soon, a star— End of section 52section 53 of mosquitoes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by michael fascio mosquitoes by william faulkner fourth day 7 o'clock the place did appear impregnable but then he had got used to the feeling it behind him in his chair where he knew nothing was going to happen to it Besides, to change now, after so many days, would be like hedging on a bat. Still, to let those two old bums kick at him about it. He paused in the door of the saloon. The others were seated and well into their dinner, but before four vacant places that bland eternal grapefruit, sinister and bland as taxes. Some of them hadn't arrived. He'd have time to run back to his room and leave it and let one of them drunkards throw it out the window for a joke? Mrs. Wiseman, carrying a tray, said briskly, Gangway, Pete! And he crowded against the wall for her to pass, and then the niece turned her head and saw him. Belly up, she said, and he heard a further trampling drawing near. He hesitated a second. Then he thrust his hat into the little cubbyhole between the two shelves. He'd risk it tonight, anyway. He could still sort of keep an eye on it. He took a seat. Fairchild's watch surged in, a hearty joviality that presently died into startled consternation when it saw the grapefruit. My God, said Fairchild in a hushed tone. Sit down, Dawson, Mrs. Wiseman ordered sharply. We've had about all that sort of humor this voyage will stand. That's what I think, he agreed readily. That's what Julius and Major Ayres and me think at every meal. And yet, when we come to the table, what do we see? My first is an Indian princess, said Mark Frost in a hollow, lilting tone. But it's a little early to play charades yet, isn't it? Major Ayres said, Eh? Looking from Mark Frost to Fairchild. Then he ventured, It's grapefruit, isn't it? But we have so many of them. Mrs. Morier explained. You are supposed to never tire of them. That's it, said Fairchild solemnly. Major Ayres guessed it the first time. I wasn't certain what it was myself. But you can't fool Major Ayres. You can't fool a man that's traveled as much as he has with just a grapefruit. I guess you've shot lots of grapefruit in China and India, haven't you, Major? Dawson, sit down, Mrs. Wiseman repeated. Make them sit down, Julius, or go out into the kitchen if they just want to stand around and talk. Fairchild sat down quickly. Never mind, he said. We can stand it if the ladies can. The human body can stand anything, he added owlishly. He can get drunk and stay up and dance all night and consume crate after crate of grr. Mrs. Wiseman leaned across his shoulder and swept his grapefruit away. Here, he exclaimed. They don't want them, she told Miss Jameson across the table. Get his, too. So they reft major airs of his also, and Mrs. Wiseman clashed the plates viciously onto her tray. In passing behind Mrs. Morier, she struck the collapsible serving table with her hip and said, Damn! 
pausing to release the catch and slam it back into the bulkhead. Pete's hat slid onto the floor, and she thrust it against the wall with her toe. Yes, sir, Fairchild repeated. The human body can stand lots of things. But if I have to eat another grapefruit... Say, Julius, I was examining my back today, and do you know my skin is getting dry and rough, with a kind of yellowish cast. If it keeps on, first thing I know I won't any more dare undress in public than Al Jack. Mark Frost made a sound of sharp alarm. Look out, people, he exclaimed, rising. I'm going to get out of here. Son would take off his shoes in public, Fairchild continued unperturbed. Mrs. Wiseman returned, and she stood with her hands on her hips, regarding Fairchild's unkempt head with disgust. Mrs. Morier gazed helplessly at him. Everyone's finished, Mrs. Wiseman said. Come on, let's go on deck. No, Mrs. Morier protested. She said firmly, Mr. Fairchild. Go on, the niece urged him. What about Al Jackson? Shut up, Pat, Mrs. Wiseman commanded. Come on, you all. Let them stay here and drivel to each other. Let's lock them in here. What do you say? Mrs. Morier asserted herself. She rose. Mr. Fairchild, I simply will not have. If you continue in this behavior, I shall leave the room. Don't you see how trying, how difficult, how difficult? Beneath the beseeching helplessness of her eyes, her various chins began to quiver a little. How difficult? Mrs. Wiseman touched her arm. Come. It's useless to argue with them now. Come, dear. She drew Mrs. Maurier's chair aside, and the old woman took a step and stopped abruptly, clutching the other's arm. I've stepped on something, she said, peering blindly. Pete rose with a mad, inarticulate cry. Old man Jackson, Fairchild continued, claims to be a lineal descendant of old Hickory a fine old southern family with all a fine old southern family's pride. Al has a lot of that pride himself. That's why he won't take off his shoes in company. I'll tell you the reason later. Well, old man Jackson was a bookkeeper or something, drawing a small salary with a big family to support, and he wanted to better himself with a minimum of labor, like a descendant of any fine old southern family naturally would, and so he thought up the idea of taking up some of this Louisiana swamp land and raising sheep on it. He'd noticed how much ranker vegetation grows on trees in swampy land, so he figured that wool ought to grow the same rank way on a sheep raised in a swamp. So he threw up his bookkeeping job and took up a few hundred acres of Chafuncta River Swamp and stocked it with sheep, using the money his wife's uncle, a member of an old aristocratic Tennessee moonshining family, had left him. But his sheep started right in to get themselves drowned, so he made life belts for them out of some small wooden kegs that had been part of the heritage from that Tennessee uncle, so that when the sheep strayed off into the deep water, they would float until the current washed them back to land again. This worked all right, but still his sheep kept on disappearing. The ewes and lambs did, that is. Then he found that the alligators were... Yes, murmured Major Ayers, old hickory getting them. So he made some imitation ram's horns out of wood and fastened a pair to each ewe and to every lamb when it was born. And that reduced his losses by alligators to a minimum scarcely worth notice. The ram's flesh seemed to be too rank even for alligators. After a time the life belts wore out. But the sheep had learned to swim pretty well by then, so old man Jackson decided it wasn't worthwhile to put any more life belts on him. The fact is, the sheep had got to like the water. The first crop of lambs would only come out of the water at feeding time. And when the first shearing time came around, he and his boys had to round up the sheep with boats. By the next shearing time, those sheep wouldn't even come out of the water to be fed. So he and his boys would go out in boats and set floating tubs of feed around in the bayous for them. This crop of lambs could dive, too. They never saw one of them on land at all. They'd only see their heads swimming across the bogues and sloughs. Finally, another sharing time came around. Old Man Jackson tried to catch one of them, but the sheep could swim faster than he and his boys could row, and the young ones dived under the water and got away. So they finally had to borrow a motorboat, and when they finally tired one of those sheep down and caught it and took it out of the water, 
they found that only the top of its back had any wool on it. The rest of its body was scaled like a fish. And when they finally caught one of the spring lambs on an alligator hook, they found that its tail had broadened out and flattened like a beaver's, and that it had no legs at all. They didn't hardly know what it was at first. I say, murmured Major Ayres. Yes, sir, completely atrophied away. Time passed, and they never saw the next crop of lambs at all. The food they set out, the birds ate, and when the next shearing time came, they couldn't even catch one with the motorboat. They hadn't even seen one in three weeks. They knew they were still there, though, because they would occasionally hear them bawing at night, way back in the swamp. They caught one occasionally on a trot line of shark hooks baited with ears of corn, but not many. Well, sir, the more old man Jackson thought about that swamp full of sheep, the madder he got. He'd stamp around the house and swear he'd catch them if he had to buy a motorboat that would run fifty miles an hour, and a diving suit for himself and every one of his boys. He had one boy named Claude, Al's brother, you know. Claude was kind of wild, hell after women, a gambler and a drunkard, a kind of handsome humorless fellow with lots of dash. And finally, Claude made a trade with his father to have half of every sheep he could catch, and he got to work right away. He never bothered with boats or trot lines. He just took off his clothes and went right into the water and grappled for them. Grappled for them, Major Ayers repeated. Sure, run one down and hem him up under the bank and drag him out with his bare hands. That was Claude all over. And then they found that this year's lambs didn't have any wool on them at all, and that its flesh was the best fish-eating in Louisiana, being partly corn-fed that way, giving it a good flavor, you see. So that's where old man Jackson quit the sheep business and went to fish ranching on a large scale. He knew he had a snap as long as Claude could catch him, so he made arrangements with the New Orleans markets right away, and they began to get rich. By Jove! Major Ayers said tensely, his mind taking fire. Claude liked the work. It was an adventurous kind of life that just suited him, so he quit everything and gave all his time to it. He quit drinking and gambling and running around at night, and there was a marked decrease in vice in that neighborhood, and the young girls pined for him at the local dances and sat on their front porches of a Sunday evening in vain. Pretty soon he could outswim the old sheep, and having to dive so much after the young ones, he got to where he could stay under water longer and longer at a time. Sometimes he'd stay under for half an hour or more, and pretty soon he got to where he'd stay in the water all day, only coming out to eat and sleep, and then they noticed that Claude's skin was beginning to look funny and that he walked kind of peculiar, like his knees were stiff or something. Soon after that he quit coming out of the water at all, even to eat, so they'd bring his dinner down to the water and leave it, and after a while he'd swim up and get it. Sometimes they wouldn't see Claude for days, but he was still catching those sheep, herding them into a pen old man Jackson had built in a shallow bayou and fenced off with hog wire, and his half of the money was growing in the bank. Occasionally half-eaten pieces of sheep would float ashore, and old man Jackson decided alligators were getting him again, but he couldn't put horns on him now because no one but Claude could catch him, and he hadn't seen Claude in some time. It had been a couple of weeks since anybody had seen Claude, when one day there was a big commotion in the sheep pen. Old man Jackson and a couple of his other boys ran down there, and when they got there they could see the sheep jumping out of the water every which way, trying to get on land again. And after a while a big alligator rushed out from among them, and old man Jackson knew what had scared the sheep. And then, right behind the alligator, he saw Claude. Claude's eyes had kind of shifted around to the side of his head, and his mouth had spread back a good way, and his teeth had got longer. And then old man Jackson knew what had scared that alligator. But that was the last they ever saw of Claude. Pretty soon after that, though, there was a shark scare at the bathing beaches along the Gulf Coast. It seemed to be a lone shark that kept annoying women bathers, especially blondes, and they knew it was Claude Jackson. He was always hell after blondes. Fairchild ceased. The niece squealed and jumped up and came to him, patting his back. Jenny's round, ineffable eyes were upon him, utterly without thought. 
The Semitic man was slumped in his chair. He may have slept. Major Ayres stared at Fairchild a long time. At last he said, But why does the alligator one wear Congress boots? Fairchild mused a moment. Then he said dramatically, He's got webbed feet. Yes, Major Ayres agreed. He mused in turn. But this chap that got rich... The niece squealed again. She sat beside Fairchild and regarded him with admiration. Go on, go on, she said. About the one that stole the money, you know. Fairchild looked at her kindly. Into the silence there came a thin, saccharine strain. There's the Victrola, he said. Let's go up and start a dance. The one who stole the money, she insisted. Please. She put her hand on his shoulder. Some other time, he promised, rising. Let's go up and dance now. The Semitic man yet slumped in his chair, and Fairchild shook him. Wake up, Julius. I'm safe now. The Semitic man opened his eyes, and Major Ayres said, How much did they gain with their fish ranching? Not as much as they would have with a patent, nice-tasting laxative. All Americans don't eat fish, you know. Come on, let's go up and hold that dance they've been worrying us about every night. End of section 53And so he thought up the idea of taking up some of this Louisiana swampland and raising sheep on it. Section 54 of Mosquitoes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michael Fascio. Mosquitoes by William Faulkner. Fourth Day. Nine o'clock. Say, the niece said as she and Jenny mounted to the deck, remember that thing we traded for the other night? The one you let me use for the one I let you use? I guess so, Jenny answered. I remember trading. Have you used it yet? I never can think of it, Jenny confessed. I never can remember what it was you told me. Besides, I've got another one now. You have? Who told it to you? The pop-eyed man, that Englishman. Major Ayres? Uh-huh. Last night we was talking, and he kept on saying for us to go to Mandeville today. He kept on saying it. And so this morning he acted like he thought I meant we was going. He acted like he was mad. What was it he said? Jenny told her a mixture of pidgin English and Hindustani that Major Ayres must have picked up along the Singapore waterfront, or mayhap at some devious and doubtful place in the Straits. But after Jenny had repeated it, it didn't sound like anything at all. What? the niece asked. Jenny said it again. It don't sound like anything to me, the niece said. Is that the way he said it? That's what it sounded like to me, Jenny replied. The niece said curiously, Men sure do swear at you a lot. They're always cursing you. What do you do to them, anyway? I don't do anything to them, Jenny answered. I'm just talking to them. Well, they sure do. Say, you can have that one back you loaned me. Have you used it on anybody? Jenny asked with interest. I tried it on that red-headed Gordon. That drowned man? What did he say? He beat me. The niece rubbed herself with a tanned, retrospective hand. He just beat hell out of me, she said. Gee, said Jenny. Ten o'clock. Fairchild gathered his watch, nourished it, and brought it on deck again. The ladies hailed its appearance with doubtful pleasure. Mr. Taliaferro and Jenny were dancing, and the niece and Pete, with his damaged hat, were performing together with a skillful and sexless abandon that was almost professional, while the rest of the party watched them. Wee! Fairchild squealed, watching the niece and Pete with growing childish admiration. At the moment they faced each other at a short distance, their bodies rigid as far as the waist. 
but below this they were as amazing jointless toys, and their legs seemed to fly in every direction at once until their knees seemed to touch the floor. Then they caught hands and whirled sharply together without a break in that dizzy staccato of heels. Say, Major, look there. Look there, Julius. Come on. I believe I can do that. He led his men to the assault. The Victrola ran down at the moment. He directed the Semitic man to attend to it, and went at once to where Pete and the niece stood. Say, you folks are regular professionals. Pete, let me have her this time, will you? I want her to show me how you do that. Will you show me? Pete won't mind. All right, the niece agreed. I'll show you. I owe you something for that yarn at dinner tonight. She put her hand on Pete's arm. Don't go off, Pete. I'll show him and then he can practice on the others. Don't you go off. You are all right. You might take Jenny for a while. She must be tired. He's been leaning on her for a half an hour. Come on, Dawson. Watch me now. She had no bones at all. Major Ayers and the Semitic man had partners, though more sedately. Major Ayers galloped around in a heavy, dragoonish manner. When that record was over, Miss Jameson was panting. She offered to sit out the next one, but Fairchild overruled her. He believed he had the knack of it. We'll put the old girl's dance over in style, he told them. Major Ayers, inflamed by Fairchild's example, offered for the niece himself. Mr. Taliaferro, reft of Jenny, acquired Mrs. Wiseman. The Semitic man was cajoling the hostess. We'll put her dance over for her, Fairchild chanted. They were off. Gordon had come up from somewhere, and he stood in shadow, watching. Come on, Gordon, Fairchild shouted to him. Grab one. When the music ceased, Gordon cut in on Major Ayers. The niece looked up in surprise, and Major Ayers departed in Jenny's direction. I didn't know you danced, she said. Why not? Gordon asked. You just don't look like you did, and you told Aunt Pat you couldn't dance. I can't, he answered, staring down at her. Bitter, he said slowly, that's what you are, new, like bark when the sap is rising. Will you give it to me? He was silent. She couldn't see his face distinctly only the bearded shape of his tall head. Why won't you give it to me? Still no answer, and his head was as ugly as bronze against the sky. Fairchild started the Victrola again. A saxophone was a wailing obscenity, and she raised her arms. Come on. When that one was finished, Fairchild's watch rushed below again, and presently Mr. Taliaferro saw his chance and followed surreptitiously. Fairchild and Major Ayers were ecstatically voluble. The small room fairly moiled with sound. Then they rushed back on deck. Watch your step, Talia Farrow, Fairchild cautioned him as they ascended. She's got her eye on you. Have you danced with her yet? Mr. Talia Farrow had not. Better kind of breathe away from her when you do. He led his men to the assault. The ladies demurred, but Fairchild was everywhere, cajoling, threatening, keeping life in the party, putting the old girl's dance over. Mrs. Morier was trying to catch Mr. Taliaferro's eye. The niece had peremptorily commandeered Pete again, and again Gordon stood in his shadow, haughty and aloof. They were off. End of section 54《Section 55 of Mosquitoes》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michael Fascio. Mosquitoes》by William Faulkner Fourth Day Eleven o'clock "'I say,' said Mr. Taliaferro, popping briskly and cautiously into the room, accepting his glass, "'we'd better slow up a bit, hadn't we?' "'What for?' asked the Semitic man, and Fairchild said, "'Oh, it's all right. She expects it of us. "'Somebody's got to be the hoi polloi, you know. "'Besides, we want to make this cruise memorable in the annals of deep water. "'Hey, Major, Taliaferro had better go easy, though.' "'Oh, we'll look out for Taliaferro,' the Semitic man said. "'No damned fear,' 
Major Ayers assured him. Have a go, eh? They all had a go. Then they rushed back on deck. What do you do in New Orleans, Pete? Miss Jameson asked intensely. One thing and another, Pete answered cautiously. I'm in business with my brother, he added. You have lots of friends, I imagine. Girls would all like to dance with you. You are one of the best dancers I ever saw. Almost a professional. I like dancing. Yeah, Pete agreed. He was restive. I guess. I wonder if you and I couldn't get together some evening and dance again. I don't go to nightclubs much, because none of the men I know dance very well. But I'd enjoy it, with you. I guess so, Pete answered. Well, I... I'll give you my phone number and address, and you can call me soon, will you? You might come out to dinner, and we'll go out afterward, you know? Sure, Pete answered uncomfortably. He removed his hat and examined the crown. Then he slanted it once more across his dark, reckless head. Miss Jameson said, Do you ever make dates ahead of time, Pete? Nah, he answered quickly. I wouldn't have a date over a day old. I just call them up and take them out and bring them back in time to go to work next day. I wouldn't have one I had to wait until tomorrow on. Neither do I. So I tell you what, let's break the rule one time and make a date for the first night we are ashore. What do you say? You come out to dinner at my house, and we'll go out later to dance. I've got a car. I... Well, you see, we'll just do that. Miss Jameson continued remorselessly. We won't forget that. It's a promise, isn't it? Pete rose. I guess we... I guess I'd better not promise. Something might turn up, so I... We couldn't make it, I guess. She sat quietly, looking at him. Maybe it'll be better to wait and fix it up when we get back. I might have to be out of town or something that day, see? Maybe we better wait and see how things shape up. Still, she said nothing, and presently she removed her patient, humorless eyes and looked out across the darkling water, and Pete stood uncomfortably with his goading urge to keep on saying something. I guess we better wait and see later, see? Her head was turned away, so he departed unostentatiously. He paused again and looked back at her. She gazed still out over the water, an uncomplaining abjectness of passivity, quiet in her shadowed chair. As he embraced her, Jenny removed his hat slanted viciously upon his reckless head and examined the broken crown with a recurrence of soft astonishment. And still holding the hat in her hand, she came to him in a flowing, enveloping movement, without seeming to move at all. Their faces merged, and Jenny was immediately utterly boneless, seeming to suspend her merging rifeness by her soft mouth, Then she opened her mouth against his. After a while, Pete raised his head. Jenny's face was a passive, drowsing blur, rich, ineffably rich, in the dark. And Pete got out his unfresh handkerchief and wiped her mouth, quite gently. Got over it without leaving a scar, didn't you? He said. Without volition, they swung in a world unseen and warm as water, unseen and rife and beautiful, strange and hushed and grave beneath that waning moon of decay and death. Give your old man a kiss, kid. The niece entered her aunt's room without knocking. Miss Morier raised her astonished, shrieking face and dragged a garment shapelessly across her recently uncorseted breast, as women do. When she had partially recovered from the shock, she ran heavily to the door and locked it. It's just me, the niece said. Say, Aunt Pat. Her aunt gasped. Her breast and chins billowed unconfined. Why don't you knock? You should never enter a room like that. Doesn't Henry ever... Sure he does, the niece interrupted. All the time. Say, Aunt Pat. Pete thinks you ought to pay him for his hat. For stepping on it, you know. Her aunt stared at her. What? You stepped through Pete's hat. He and Jenny think you ought to pay for it, or offer to anyway. I expect if you'd offer to, he wouldn't take it. Thinks I ought to... Miss Morier's face faded into a shocked, soundless amazement. Yes, they think so. 
I mentioned it because I promised them I would. You don't have to unless you want to, you know. Thanks, I ought to p Again, Miss Morier's voice failed her, and her amazement became a chaotic thing that filled her round face interestingly. Then it froze into something definite, a coldly determined displeasure, and she recovered her voice. I have lodged and fed these people for a week, she said without humor. I do not feel that I am called upon to clothe them also. Well, I just mentioned it because I promised, the niece repeated soothingly. Mrs. Morier, Jenny, and the niece had disappeared, to Mr. Taliaferro's mixed relief. They still had two left, however. They took turn about with them. Major Ayres, Fairchild, and the Semitic man rushed below again. Mr. Taliaferro followed openly this time, and a trifle erratically. "'How's it coming along?' Fairchild asked, poising the bottle. Mr. Taliaferro made a wet, deprecating sound, glancing at the other two. They regarded him with kindly interest. "'Oh, they're all right,' Fairchild reassured him. "'They are all as anxious to see you put over as I am.' He set the bottle down well within reach, and gulped at his glass. "'I tell you what, it's boldness that does the trick with women, ain't it, Major?' "'Right you are. Boldness.' Dash in, take him by storm. Sure, that's what you want to do. Have another drink. He filled Mr. Taliaferro's glass. That's my plan, exactly. Boldness, boldness, boldness. Mr. Taliaferro stared at the other glassily. He tried to wink. Didn't you see me dancing with her? Yes, but that ain't bold enough. If I were you, if I were doing it, I'd turn the trick tonight, now. Say, Julius, you know what I'd do? I'd go right to her room, walk right in. He's been dancing with her and talking to her. Ground already broken, you see. I bet she's in there right now, waiting for him, hoping he is bold enough to come in to her. He'll feel pretty cheap tomorrow when he finds he missed his chance, won't he? You never have but one chance with a woman, you know. If you fail her then, she's done with you. The next man that comes along gets her without a struggle. It ain't the man a woman cares for that reaps the harvest of passion, you know. It's the next man that comes along after she's lost the other one. I'd sure hate to think I'd been doing work for somebody else to get the benefit of, wouldn't you? Mr. Taliaferro stared at him. He swallowed twice. But suppose, just suppose, that she isn't expecting me. Oh, sure. Of course you've got to take that risk. It would take a bold man, anyway, to walk right in her room, walk right in without knocking, and go straight to the bed. But how many women would resist? I wouldn't, if I were a woman. If you were her, Taliaferro, would you resist? I've found, he went on, that boldness gets pretty near anything in this world, especially women. But it takes a bold man. Say, I bet Major Ayres would do it. Right you are. I'd walk in, by Jove. I say I think I shall, anyway. Which one is it? Not the old one. All right. That is, if Taliaferro don't want to do it. He has first shot, you know. He's done all the heavy preparatory work. But it takes a bold man. Oh, Taliaferro's bold as any man, the Semitic man said. But really, Mr. Taliaferro repeated, suppose she isn't expecting me. Suppose she were to call out. No, no. Yes, Taliaferro ain't bold enough. We'd better let Major Ayres go, after all. No necessity for disappointing the girl, at least. Besides, Mr. Taliaferro added quickly, she is in a room with someone else. No, she ain't. She's in a room to herself, now. That one at the end of the hall. That's Mrs. Morier's room, Mr. Taliaferro said, staring at him. No, no, she changed. That room has a broken screen, so she changed. Julius and I were helping her move this afternoon, weren't we, Julius? That's how I happen to know Jenny's in there now. But really, Mr. Taliaferro swallowed again, are you sure that's her room? This is a serious matter, you know. Have another drink, Fairchild said. End of section 55
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mosquitoes by William Faulkner. Fourth Day, Part 10, 12 o'clock. The deck was deserted. Fairchild and Major Ayers halted and gazed about in pained astonishment. The Victrola was hooded and mute, smugly inscrutable. They held a hurried council, then they set forth to beat up stragglers. There were no stragglers. Put on a record, Fairchild suggested at last. Maybe that'll get em up here. They must have thought we'd gone to bed. The Semitic man started the Victrola again, and again Major Ayers and Fairchild combed the deck in vain. The moon had risen. Its bony erstwhile disc was thumbed into the sky like a coin after too much handling. Mrs. Morier rooted out the captain, and together they repaired to Fairchild's room. Find it all, she directed, every single one. The captain found it all. Now, open that window. She gave the captain further directions when they had finished, and she returned to her room and sat again on the edge of her bed. Moonlight came into the room level as a lance through the port, like a marble pencil shattering and filling the room with a thin silver dust as of marble. It has come at last, she whispered, aware of her body, heavy and soft with years. I should feel happy. I should feel happy, she told herself. But her limbs felt chill and strange to her, and within her a terrible thing was swelling, a thing terrible and poisonous, and released like water that has been dammed too long. It was as though there were waking within her comfortable, long, familiar body, a thing that abode there dormant, and which she had harboured unaware. She sat on the edge of her bed, feeling her strange, chill limbs, while that swelling thing within her unfolded like an intricate poisonous flower, an intricate, slow convolvulae of petals that grew and faded, died and were replaced by other petals, huger and more implacable. Her limbs were strange and cold. They were trembling. That dark flower of laughter, that secret hideous flower, grew and grew until that entire world which was herself was become a slow, implacable swirling of hysteria that rose in her throat and shook it as though with a myriad small hands while from overhead there came a thin saccharine strain spaced off by a heavy thumping of feet where Fairchild was teaching Major Ayers the Charleston. And soon another sound, and the Nausicaa trembled and pulsed, girding herself with motion. Mr. Taliaferro stood in the bows, letting the wind blow upon his face amid his hair. The worn moon had risen, and she spread her boneless hand upon the ceaseless water, and the cold, remote stars swung overhead, cold and remote and incurious. What cared they for the haggard despair in his face, for the hushed despair in his heart? They had seen too much of human moiling and indecision and astonishments to be concerned over the fact that Mr. Taliaferro had got himself engaged to marry again. Soon, a sound, and the Nausicaa trembled and pulsed, girding herself with motion. Suddenly Fairchild stopped, raising his hand for silence. "'What's that?' he asked. "'What's what?' responded Major Ayers, pausing also and staring at him. I thought I heard something fall into the water. He crossed to the rail and leaned over it. Major Ayres followed him, and they listened. But the dark, restless water was untroubled by any foreign sound. The night was calm, islanding the worn, bland disk of the moon. Stuart, throwing out grapefruit, Major Ayres suggested at last. They turned away. Hope so, Fairchild said. Start her up again, Julius, and soon another sound, and the Nausicaa trembled and pulsed, girding herself with motion. End of section 56, read by Sandra, near Montreal, 2023. Section 57 of Mosquitoes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michael Fascio. 
Mosquitoes, by William Faulkner. Epilogue, Part 1 Lake water had done strange things to Jenny's little green dress. It was rough-dried and draggled, and it had kind of sagged here and drawn up there. The skirt in the back, for instance, because now between the gracious miniature ballooning of its hem and the tops of her dingy stockings, you saw pink flesh. But she was ineffably unaware of this as she stood on Canal Street waiting for her car to come along, watching Pete's damaged hat slanting away amid the traffic, clutching the dime he had given her for car fare in her little soiled hand. Soon her car came along and she got in it and gave the conductor her dime and received change and put seven cents in the machine while men, unshaven men and coatless men and old men and spruce young men and men that smelled of toilet water and bay rum and sweat and men that smelled of just sweat watched her with the moist abjectness of hounds. Then she went on up the aisle, rife, placidly unreluctant, and then the car jolted forward and she sat partly upon a fat man and a derby and a newspaper, who looked up at her and then hunched over to the window and dived again into his newspaper with his derby on. The car hummed and spurted and jolted and stopped and jolted and hummed and spurted between crouching walls and old iron lovely as dingy lace, and shrieking children from South Europe, once removed and wild and soft as animals and cheerful with filth, and old rich food smells, smells rich enough to fatten the flesh through the lungs, and women screaming from adjacent door to door in bright, dirty shawls. Her three pennies had got warm and moist in her hand, so she changed them to the other hand and dried her palm on her thigh. Soon it was a broader street at right angles, a weary green spaciousness of late August foliage and civilization again in the shape of a filling station, and she descended and passed between houses possessing once and long ago individuality, reserve, but now become somehow vaguely and dingily identical, reaching at last an iron gate through which she went, and on up a shallow narrow concrete walk bordered on either side by beds in which flowers, for some reason, never seemed to grow well, and so on across the veranda and into the house. Her father was on the night force, and he now sat in his sock feet, and with his galluses down, at his supper of mackerel, it is Friday, and fried potatoes and coffee in an early afternoon edition. He wiped his mustache with two sweeps of the back of his hand. Where you been? Jenny entered the room, removing her hat. She dropped it to the floor and came up in a flanking movement. On a boat ride, she answered. Her father drew his feet under his chair to rise, and his face suffused slowly with relief and anger. And you think you can go off like that, without a word to nobody, and then just walk back into this house? But Jenny captured him, and she squirmed onto his rising lap, and, though he tried to defend himself, kissed him through his mackerelish mustache, and held him speechless, so while she delved amid that vague, pinnish region which was her mind. After a while, she remembered it. Haul up your sheet, she said. You're jibbing. End of section 57《セクション58of Mosquitoes》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michael Fascio.《Mosquitoes by William Faulkner》Epilogue, Part 2 Pete was the baby. He was too young to have been aware of it, of course, but that electric sign with the family name on it had marked a climacteric. The phoenix-like rise of the family fortunes from the dun ashes of respectability, and a small restaurant catering to Italian working people, to the final and ultimate Americanization of the family, since this fortune, like most American ones, was built on the flouting of a statutory impediment. Prior to 1919, you entered a dingy room fecund with the rich heavy odor of Italian cooking, you sat, surrounded by Italian faces and frank Italian eating sounds, 
at oilcloth of a cheerful red and white check and cunningly stained, impermeated with food, where you were presently supplied with more food. Perhaps old lady Ginotta herself came bustling out with soup and one thumb and a thick platter and a brisk word for you. Or by Joe, anyway, bare-armed and skillful and taciturn. While Mr. Ginotta himself, in his stained apron, stood talking to a table of his intimates. Perhaps, if you lingered long enough over your banana or overripe, oft-handled grapes, you would see Pete in his ragged corduroy knickers and faded clean shirt, with his curling shock of hair and his queer golden eyes, twelve years old and beautiful as only an Italian lad can be. But now all of this was changed. Where was once a dingy food-laden room, wooden-floored and not too clean, was now a tiled space cleared and waxed for dancing, and enclosed on one side by mirrors and on the other by a row of booths, containing each a table and two chairs and lighted each by a discreet table lamp of that surreptitious and unmistakable shade of pink and curtained each with heavy maroon rep. And where you once got food good and Italian and cheap, you now paid so much for it that you were not required to eat it at all. And platters of spaghetti and roasted whole fowls, borne not by Joe, bare-armed and skillful and taciturn, but by dinner-coated waiters with faces ironed and older than sin. Platters, which served as stage properties for the oldest and weariest comedy in the world, were served you and later removed by the waiters with a sort of clairvoyant ubiquity and returned to the kitchen, practically intact. And from the kitchen, there came no longer any odor of cooking at all. Joe's idea, it was. Joe, five and twenty and more American than any of them, had seen the writing on the wall, had argued, prevailed, and proven himself right. Mr. Ginotta had not stood prosperity. He was afraid of the new floor, to begin with. It was too slick dangerous for a man of his age and bulk, and to look out of his kitchen, that kitchen into which he no longer dared bring his stained apron, upon a room once crowded with his friends and noisy and cheerful with eating and smells of food. But all that was changed now. The very waiters themselves he did not know, and the food they bore back and forth was not food, and the noise was now a turgid pandemonium of saxophones and drums and riding above it like distracted birds, a shrill and metallic laughter of women, ceaseless and without joy, and the smells a blending of tobacco and alcohol and unchaste scent. And from the kitchen there came no longer any odor of cooking at all. Even his range was gone, replaced by an oil stove. So he died, fairly full of years and with more money to his name in the bank than most Italian princes have. Mrs. Ginotta had the flu at the same time. It had settled in her ears, and as time passed, she became quite deaf. And because of the fact that her old friends now went elsewhere to dine, and the people who came now arrived quite late, after she was in bed mostly, and her old man was dead and her sons were such Americans now, busy and rich and taciturn, and because the strange waiters frightened her a little, the old lady had got out of the habit of talking at all. She prepared food for her sons on the new stove of which she was afraid. But they were in and out so much it was hard to anticipate their mealtimes. And her eyes being no longer good enough for sewing, she spent her time puttering about their living quarters overhead or in a corner of the kitchen where she would be out of the way, preparing vegetables and such, things that didn't require keenness of sight or attention. The room itself she would not enter, though from her accustomed corner in the kitchen she could on occasion watch the boneless sophistication of the saxophone player and the drummer's flapping elbows, and years ago she had heard the noise they made. But that was long ago, and she had forgotten it, and now she accepted their antics as she accepted the other changes, associating no sound with them at all. Joe had several automobiles now, big noticeable ones, and he used to try to persuade her to ride in them. But she refused stubbornly always, though it was a matter of neighborhood comment, how good the Ginotta boys were to the old lady. But Joe, 
with his shrewd taciturn face and his thinning hair and his shirt of heavy striped silk smoothly taut across his tight embryonic paunch joe standing with his head waiter at the desk paused in his occupation to glance down that room with its every modern fixture its tiled floor and lights and mirrors with commendable pride with the quiet joy of ownership his gaze followed its mere diminishing tunnel and passed on to the discreetly curtained entrance beneath that electric sign that ultimate accolade of americanization flashing his name in golden letters in rain or mist or against the remote insane stars themselves and to his brother slanting his damaged hat defiantly turning in beneath it joe held his sheaf of banknotes in one hand and his poised wetted finger over it and watched pete traverse the mirrored length of the room where in hell you been he demanded to the country pete answered shortly anything to eat eat hell his brother exclaimed here i've had to pay a man two days just because you were off helling around somewheres and now you come in talking about something to eat here he put aside a sheaf of money and from a drawer he took a pack of small slips of paper and ran through them the head waiter counted money undisturbed methodically i promised this stuff to her by noon you get busy and run it out there here's the address and no more foolishness see eat hell but pete had brushed past the other without even pausing his brother followed him you get right at it you hear he raised his voice. You think you can walk out of here and stay as long as you want, huh? You think you can come strolling back after a week, huh? You think you own this place? The old lady was waiting inside the kitchen. She didn't hardly talk at all anymore, only made sounds, wet sounds of satisfaction and alarm. And she saw her older son's face, and she made those sounds now, looking from one to the other but not offering to touch them. Pete entered the room, and his brother stopped at the door, and the old lady shuffled across to the stove and fetched Pete a plate of warmed-over spaghetti and fish and set it before him at a zinc-covered table. His brother stood in the door and glared at him. "'Get up from there now, like I told you. Come on, come on, you can eat when you get back.' But the old lady bustled around, getting between them with the stubborn barrier of her deafness and her alarmed sounds rose again, then fell, and became a sort of meaningless crooning while she kept herself between them, pushing Pete's plate nearer, patting his knife and fork into his hands. Look out, Pete said at last, pushing her hands away. Joe glared from the door, but he humored her, as he always did. Make it snappy, he said gruffly, turning away. When he had gone, the old lady returned to her chair and her discarded bowl of vegetables. Pete ate hungrily. Sounds came back to him, a broom and indistinguishable words. And then the street door opened and closed, and above a swift tapping of heels he heard a woman's voice. It spoke to his brother at the desk. But the brittle staccato came on without stopping. And as Pete raised his head, the girl entered on her high, cheap heels and an unbelievable length of pale stocking severed sharply by her skimpy dark frock. Within the small, bright bell of her hat, her painted, passionate face, and her tawdry shrillness was jointless and poised as a thin tree. "'Where you been?' she asked. "'Off with some women,' he resumed his meal. "'More than one?' she asked quickly, watching him. Yeah, five or six. Reason it took me so long. Oh, she said. You're some little papa, ain't you? He continued to eat, and she came over beside him. What you so glum about? Somebody take your candy away from you? She removed his hat. Say, look at your hat. She stared at it then laid it on the table, and sliding her hand into his thickly curling hair, she tugged his face up and his queer golden eyes. Wipe your mouth off, she said. But she kissed him anyway, and raised her head again. You better wipe it off now, sure enough, she said with contemplation. She released his hair. Well, I gotta go. And she turned. 
but paused again at the old lady's chair and screamed at her in Italian. The old lady looked up, nodding her head, then bent over her beans again. Pete finished his meal. He could still hear her shrill voice from the other room, and he lit a cigarette and strolled out. The old lady hadn't been watching him, but as soon as he was gone, she got up and removed the plate and washed it and put it away, and then sat down again and picked up her bowl. Ready to go, huh? His brother looked up from the desk. Here's the address. Snap it up now. I told her I'd have it out there by noon. The bulk of Joe's business was outside, like this. He had a name for reliability of which he was proud. Take the Studebaker, he added. That old hack? Pete paused, protesting. I'll take your Chrysler. Damn if you will, his brother rejoined, heating again. Get on now. Take that Studebaker like I told you, he said violently. If you don't like it, buy one of your own. Ah, shut up, Pete turned away. With one of the booths, beyond a partly drawn curtain, he saw her facing the mirror, renewing the paint on her mouth. Beside her stood one of the waiters in his shirt sleeves, holding a mop. She made a swift signal with her hand to his reflection in the glass. He slanted his hat again, without replying. She was an old hack, beside the fawn and nickel splendor of the new Chrysler. But she would go, and she'd carry six or seven cases comfortably. The four cases he now had were just peas in a matchbox. He followed the traffic to Canal Street, crossed it, and fell into the line, waiting to turn on St. Charles. The line inched forward, stopped, inched forward again when the bell rang. The policeman at the curb held the line again, and Pete sat watching the swarming, darting newsboys, and the loafers and shoppers and promenaders, and little colt-like girls with their monotonous blonde legs. The bell rang, but the cops still held them. Pete leaned out, jazzing his idling engine. Come on, come on, you blue-bellied bastard, he called. Let's go. At last, the cop lowered his glove, and Pete whipped skillfully into St. Charles, and presently the street widened and became an avenue picketed with palms and settling onto his spine and slanting his damaged straw hat to a swaggering slant on his dark, reckless head. He began to overhaul the slow ones, passing them up. End of section 58「Fairchild's splitting head ultimately roused him, and he lay for some time submerged in the dull, throbbing misery of his body, before he discovered that the boat was stationary again, and, after an effort of unparalleled stoicism, that it was eleven o'clock. No sound anywhere. Yet there was something in the atmosphere of his surroundings, something different. But trying to decide what it was only made his head pound the worse, so he gave it up and lay back again. The Semitic man slumbered in his berth. After a while, Fairchild groaned, and rose and wavered blundering across the cabin and drank deeply of water. Then he saw land through the port, a road, and a weathered board wall, and beyond it trees. Mandeville, he decided. He tried to rouse the Semitic man, but the other cursed him from slumber and rolled over to face the wall. He hunted again for a bottle, but there were not even any empty ones. Whoever did it had made a clean sweep. Well, a cup of coffee, then. So he got into his trousers and crossed the passage to a lavatory and held his head beneath the tap for a while. Then he returned and finished dressing and sallied forth. Someone slumbered audibly in Major Ayer's room. It was Major Ayer's himself, and Fairchild closed the door and went on, struck anew with that strange atmosphere which the yacht seemed to have gained overnight. The saloon was empty also, and a broken meal offended his temporarily refined sensibilities with partially emptied cups and cold-soiled plates. But still no sound, 
No human sound, save major airs and the Semitic man in slumber's strophe and antistrophe. He stood in the door of the saloon and groaned again. Then he took his splitting head on deck. Here he blinked in the light, shutting his eyes against it while hot brass hammers beat against his eyeballs. Three men dangled their legs over the edge of the key and regarded him, and he opened his eyes again and saw the three men. "'Good morning,' he said. "'What town's this? Mandeville?' The three men looked at him. After a time, one said, "'Mandeville? Mandeville what?' "'What town is it, then?' he asked. But as he spoke, awareness came to him, and looking about, he saw a steel bridge and a trolley on the bridge, and further still, a faint mauve smudge on the sky, and in the other direction, the flag that floated above the yacht club, languorous in a faint breeze. The three men sat and swung their legs and watched him. Presently, one of them said, Your party went off and left you. Looks like it, Fairchild agreed. Do you know if they said anything about sending a car back for us? No, she ain't going to send back today, the man answered. Fairchild cleared his aching eyes. It was the captain. Trolley back over yonder a ways, he called after Fairchild as he turned and descended the companionway. Part 4 Major Eyre's appointment was for three o'clock. His watch corroborated and commended him as he stepped from the elevator into a long, cool corridor, glassed on either hand by opaque plate from beyond which came a thin tapping of typewriters. Soon he found the right door and entered it, and across a low barrier he gave his card to a thin scented girl, glaring at her affably, and stood in the ensuing interval gazing out the window across diversified rectangles of masonry toward the river. The girl returned. Mr. Reichman will see you now, she said across her chewing gum, swinging the gate open for him. Mr. Reichman shook his hand and offered him a chair and a cigar. He asked Major Ayers for his impressions of New Orleans, and immediately interrupted the caller's confused staccato response to ask Major Ayers, for whom the war had served as the single possible condition under which he could have returned to England at all, and to whom, for certain private reasons, London had been interdict since the armistice, how affairs compared between the two cities. Then he swung back in his patent chair and said, "'Now, Major, just what is your proposition?' "'Ah, yes,' said Major Ayres, flicking the ash from his cigar. "'It's assaults. Now all Americans are constipated.'" End of Section 59section 60 of mosquitoes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by rita butros mosquitoes by william faulkner epilogue part 5 beneath him on the ground floor where a rectangle of light fell outward across the alley a typewriter was being hammered by a heavy and merciless hand fairchild sat with a cigar on his balcony just above the unseen but audible typist enjoying the cool darkness and the shadowed tree-filled spaciousness of the cathedral close beneath his balcony an occasional trolley clanged and crashed up royal street but this was but seldom and when it had died away there was no sound save the monotonous merging clatter of the typewriter then he saw and recognized mr taliaferro turning the corner and with an exclamation of alarm he sprang to his feet kicking his chair over backward ducking quickly into the room redolent of penny royal he snapped off the reading lamp and leaped upon a couch feigning sleep mr taliaferro walked dapperly swinging his stick his goal in sight yes fairchild was right he knew women the feminine soul no not soul they have no souls nature the feminine nature that substance that very substance of their being impalpable as moonlight 
challenging and retreating at the same time, inconsistent, nay, incomprehensible, yet serving their ends with such a devastating practicality. As though the earth, the world, man and his very desires and impulses themselves had been invented for the sole purpose of hushing their little hungry souls by filling their time through serving their biological ends yes boldness and propinquity and opportunity that happy conjunction of technique and circumstance being with the right one in the right place at the right time yes yes opportunity opportunity more important than all perhaps mr taliaferro put up opportunity he called for a ballot the eyes had it he stopped utterly still in the flash of his inspiration at last he had it had the trick the magic word it was so simple that he stood in amaze at the fact that it had not occurred to him before. But then he realized that its very simplicity was the explanation. And my nature is complex, he told himself, gazing at stars in the hot dark sky, in a path of sky above the open coffin of the street it was so devastatingly simple that he knew a faint qualm was it was it exactly sporting wasn't it like shooting quail on the ground but no no now that he had the key now that he had found the word he dared admit to himself that he had suffered not so much in his vanity not physically after all man can do without the pleasures of love it will not kill him but because each failure seemed to put years behind him with far more finality than the mere recurrence of natal days yes mr taliaferro owed himself reparation let them suffer who must and was not that woman's part from time immemorial opportunity create your opportunity prepare the ground by overlooking none of those small important trivialities which mean so much to them then take advantage of it and i can do that he told himself indifference perhaps as though women were no rare thing with me that there is perhaps another woman i had rather have seen but circumstances over which neither of us had any control intervened they like a man who has other women for some reason can it be that love to them is half adultery and half jealousy yes i can do that sort of thing i really can she would have one suit of black underthings mr taliaferro said aloud with a sort of exultation he struck the pavement with his stick lightly. "'By God, that's it!' he exclaimed in a hushed tone, striding on. "'Create the opportunity. Lead up to it delicately but firmly. Drop a remark about coming to-night only because I had promised. Yes, they like an honorable man. It increases their latitude. She'll say, "'Please take me to dance.' and I'll say, no, really, I don't care to dance tonight. And she'll say, won't you take me, leaning against me, eh? Let's see. Yes, she'll take my hand, but I shan't respond at once. She'll tease, and then I'll put my arm around her, and raise her face in the dark cab and kiss her coldly, and I'll say, do you really want to dance tonight? and then she'll say oh i don't know suppose we just drive around a while will she say that at this point well should she not let's see what would she say mr taliaferro strode on musing swiftly well anyway if she says that if she does say that then i'll say no let's dance yes yes something like that though perhaps i'd better kiss her again not so coldly perhaps but should she say something else 
but then i shall be prepared for any contingency eh half the battle yes something like that delicately but firmly done so as not to alarm the quarry some walls are carried by storm but all walls are reduced by siege there is also the fable of the wind and the sun and the man in a cloak we'll change the gender by jove mr taliaferro said aloud breaking suddenly from his reverie to discover that he had passed fairchild's door he retraced his steps and craned his neck to see the dark window fairchild no reply oh fairchild the two dark windows were inscrutable as two fates he pressed the bell then stepped back to complete his aria beside the door was another entrance light streamed across a half-length lattice blind like a saloon door beyond it a typewriter was being thumped viciously mr taliaferro knocked diffidently upon the blind hello a voice boomed above the clattering machine though the machine itself did not falter mr taliaferro pondered briefly then he knocked again come in damn you the voice drowned the typewriter temporarily come in do you think this is a bathroom mr taliaferro opened the blind and the huge collarless man at the typewriter raised his sweating leonine head and regarded mr taliaferro fretfully well pardon me i am looking for fairchild next floor the other snapped poising his hands good night but he doesn't answer do you happen to know if he is in tonight i do not mr taliaferro pondered again diffidently i wonder how i might ascertain i'm pressed for time how in hell do i know go up and see or stand out there and call him thanks i'll go up if you've no objection well go up then the big man answered leaping again upon his typewriter mr taliaferro watched him for a time may i go through this way he ventured at last mildly and politely yes yes go anywhere but for god's sake don't bother me any longer mr taliaferro murmured thanks and sidled past the large frenzied man the whole small room trembled to the man's heavy hands and the typewriter leaped and chattered like a mad thing he went on and into a dark corridor filled with a thin vicious humming and mounted lightless stairs into an acrid region scented with pennyroyal fairchild heard him stumble in the darkness and groaned i'll have your blood for this he swore at the thundering oblivious typewriter beneath him after a time his door opened and the caller hissed fairchild into the room fairchild swore again under his breath the couch complained to his movement and he said wait there until i turn up the light you'll break everything i've got blundering around in the dark mr taliaferro sighed with relief well well i had just about given you up and gone away when that man beneath you kindly let me come through his place the light came on under fairchild's hand oh you were asleep weren't you so sorry to have disturbed you but i want your advice as i failed to see you this morning you got home all right he asked with thoughtful tact fairchild answered yes shortly and mr taliaferro laid his hat and stick on a table knocking therefrom a vase of late summer flowers with amazing agility he caught the vase before it crashed though not before its contents had liberally splashed him ah oh, the devil he ejaculated he replaced the vase and quickly fell to mopping at his sleeves and coat front with his handkerchief and this suit fresh from the presser too he added with exasperation fairchild watched him with ill-suppressed vindictive glee too bad 
he commiserated insincerely, lying again on the couch. But she won't notice it. She'll be too interested in what you're saying to her. Mr. Taliaferro looked up quickly, a trifle dubiously. He spread his handkerchief across the corner of the table to dry. Then he smoothed his hands over his neat, pale hair. Do you think so, really? That's what I stopped in to discuss with you. For a while, Mr. Taliaferro sat neatly and gazed at his host from beyond a barrier of a polite and hopeless despair. Fairchild remarked his expression with sudden curiosity, but before he could speak, Mr. Taliaferro reassimilated himself and became again his familiar articulated mild alarm. "'What's the matter?' Fairchild asked. "'I? Nothing, nothing at all, my dear fellow. Why do you ask?' "'You look like you had something on your mind just then.' The guest laughed artificially. "'Not at all. You imagined it, really.' His hidden dark thing lurked behind his eyes yet, but he vanquished it temporarily. I will ask a favor, however, before I, before I ask your advice, that you don't mention our conversation, the general trend of it, you know. Fairchild watched him with curiosity. To any of our mutual women friends, he added further, meeting his host's curious gaze. All right, Fairchild agreed. I never mention any of the conversations we have on this subject. I don't reckon I'll start now. Thank you. Mr. Taliaferro was again his polite, smug self. I have a particular reason this time, which I'll divulge to you as soon as I consider myself. You will be the first to know. Sure, said Fairchild again. What is it to be this time? Ah, yes said the guest with swift optimism. I really believe that I have discovered the secret of success with them. Create the proper setting beforehand, indifference to pique them, then boldness. That is what I have always overlooked. Listen, tonight I shall turn the trick. But I want your advice. Fairchild groaned and lay back. Mr. Taliaferro picked his handkerchief from the table and whipped it about his ankles. He continued, Now I shall make her jealous to begin with by speaking of another woman in a uh, quite intimate terms. She will doubtless wish to dance, but I shall pretend indifference, and when she begs me to take her to dance, perhaps I'll kiss her, suddenly but with detachment. You see? "'Yes,' murmured the other, cradling his head on his arms and closing his eyes. "'Yes, so we'll go and dance, and I'll pet her a bit, still impersonally, as if I were thinking of someone else. She'll naturally be intrigued, and she'll say, "'What are you thinking of?' And I'll say, "'Why do you want to know?' She'll plead with me, perhaps dancing quite close to me, cajoling, but I'll say, I'd rather tell you what you are thinking of, and she will say, what, immediately, and I'll say, you are thinking of me. Now what do you think of that? What will she say then? Probably tell you you've got a swelled head. Mr. Taliaferro's face fell. Do you think she'll say that? Don't know. You'll find out soon enough. No. Mr. Taliaferro said after a while, I don't believe she will. I rather fancied she'd think I knew a lot about women. He mused deeply for a time. Then he burst out again. If she does, I'll say, perhaps so. But I am tired of this place. Let's go. She'll not want to leave, but I'll be firm. And then... Mr. Taliaferro became smug, bursting with something he withheld. No, no, I shan't tell you. It's too excruciatingly simple. Why, someone else has not. He sat gloating. Scared I'll run out and use it myself before you have a chance? Fairchild asked. 
No, really, not at all. I... He considered a moment, then he leaned to the other. It's not that at all, really. I only feel that, being the discoverer, that sort of thing, eh? I trust you, my dear fellow, he added swiftly in a burst of confidence. Merely my own scruples, you see. Sure, said Fairchild dryly. I understand. You will have so many opportunities, while I... Again that dark thing came up behind Mr. Taliaferro's eyes, and peered forth a moment. He drove it back. And you really think it will work? Sure, provided that final coup is as deadly as you claim, and provided she acts like she ought to. It might be a good idea to outline the plot to her, though, so she won't slip up herself. "'You are pulling my leg now,' Mr. Taliaferro bridled slightly. "'But don't you think this plan is good?' "'Air tight. You've thought of everything, haven't you?' "'Surely that's the only way to win battles, you know. Napoleon taught us that.' "'Napoleon said something about the heaviest artillery, too,' the other said wickedly. Mr. Taliaferro smiled with deprecatory complacence. "'I am as I am,' he murmured. "'Especially when it hasn't been used in some time,' Fairchild added. Mr. Taliaferro looked like a struck beast, and the other said quickly, "'But are you going to try this scheme tonight, or are you just describing a hypothetical case?' Mr. Taliaferro produced his watch and glanced at it in consternation. "'Good gracious, I must run!' He sprang to his feet and thrust his handkerchief into his pocket. "'Thanks for advising me. I really think I have the system at last, don't you?' "'Sure,' the other agreed. At the door, Mr. Taliaferro turned and rushed back to shake hands. "'Wish me luck,' he said, turning again. He paused once more. "'Our little talk. You'll not mention it.' "'Sure, sure,' repeated Fairchild. The door closed upon the collar, and his descending feet sounded on the stairs. He stumbled again, then the street door closed behind him, and Fairchild rose and stood on the balcony and watched him out of sight. Fairchild returned to the couch and reclined again, laughing. Abruptly he ceased chuckling, and lay for a time in alarmed concern. Then he groaned again, and rose and took his hat. As he stepped into the alley, the Semitic man pausing at the entrance spoke to him. "'Where are you going?' he asked. "'I don't know,' Fairchild replied. "'Somewhere.' The great illusion has just called, he explained. He has an entirely new scheme tonight. Oh, slipping out, are you? The other asked, lowering his voice. No, he just dashed away. But I don't dare stay in this evening. He'll be back inside of two hours to tell me why this one didn't work. We'll have to go somewhere else. The Semitic man mopped his handkerchief across his bald head. Beyond the lattice blind, beside them, the typewriter still chattered. Fairchild chuckled again. Then he sighed. I wish Talafiero could find him a woman. I'm tired of being seduced. Let's go over to Gordon's. End of section 60「Section 61 of Mosquitoes – this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Mosquitoes by William Faulkner. Epilogue, Part 6. The niece had already yawned elaborately several times at the lone guest, she was prepared and recognized the preliminary symptoms indicating that her brother was on the point of his customary abrupt and muttered departure from the table she rose also with alacrity well she said briskly i've enjoyed knowing you a lot mark 
next summer maybe we'll be back here and we'll have to do it again won't we patricia her aunt said sit down i'm sorry aunt pat but josh wants me to sit with him tonight he's going away tomorrow she explained to the guest aren't you going too mark frost asked yes but this is our last night here and gus wants me to not me her brother denied quickly you needn't come away on my account well i think i'd better anyway her aunt repeated patricia but the niece ignored her she circled the table and shook the guest's hand briskly before he could rise good-bye she repeated until next summer her aunt said patricia again firmly she turned again at the door and said politely good night aunt pat her brother had gone on up the stairs she hurried after him leaving her aunt to call patricia from the dining-room and reached the head of the stairs in time to see his door close behind him when she tried the knob the door was locked so she came away and went quietly to her room she stripped off her clothes in the darkness and lay on her bed and after a while she heard him banging and splashing in the connecting bathroom when these sounds had ceased she rose and entered the bathroom quietly from her side and quietly she tried his door unlocked she snapped on the light and spun the tap of the shower until needles of water drummed viciously into the bath she thrust her hand beneath it at intervals soon it was stinging and cold and she drew her breath as for a dive and sprang beneath it clutching a cake of soap and cringed shuddering and squealing while the water needled her hard simple body in its startling bathing suit of white skin matting her coarse hair stinging and blinding her she whirled the tap again and the water ceased its antiseptic miniature thunder and after toweling herself vigorously she found that she was hot as ever though not sticky any longer so moving more slowly she returned to her room and donned fresh pajamas this suit had as yet its original cord then she went on her bare silent feet and stood again at the door of her brother's room listening look out josh she called suddenly flinging open the door i'm coming in his room was dark but she could discern the shape of him on the bed and she sped across the room and plumped jouncing on to the bed beside him he jerked himself up sharply here he exclaimed what do you want to come in here worrying me for he raised himself still further a brief violent struggle and the niece thudded solidly on the floor she said ow in a muffled surprised tone now get out and stay out her brother added i want to go to sleep oh let me stay a while i'm not going to bother you haven't you been staying under my feet for a week without coming in here where i'm trying to go to sleep get out now just a little while she begged i'll lie still if you want to go to sleep you won't keep still you go on now please gus i swear i will well he agreed at last grudgingly but if you start flopping around i'll be still she promised she slid quickly on to the bed and lay rigidly on her back outside in the hot darkness insects scraped and rattled and droned the room however was a spacious quiet coolness and the curtains at the windows stirred in a ghost of a breeze josh she lay flat perfectly still huh didn't you do something to that boat after a while he said what boat she was silent taut with listening he said why what would i want to do anything to the boat for what makes you think i did didn't you now honest you're crazy i never hurt i never was down there except when you came tagging down there that morning what would i want to do anything to it for they lay motionless a kind of tenseness he said suddenly did you tell her i did something to it oh don't be a goof i'm not going to tell on you you're damn right you won't 
I never did anything to it. All right, all right. I'm not going to tell if you haven't got guts, too. You're yellow, Josh, she told him calmly. Look here, I told you that if you wanted to stay in here, you'd have to keep quiet, didn't I? Shut up, then, or get out. Didn't you break that boat, honest? No, I told you. Now you shut up or get out of here. They lay quiet for a time. After a while she moved carefully, turning onto her belly by degrees. She lay still again for a time, then she raised her head. He seemed to be asleep, so she lowered her head and relaxed her muscles, spreading her arms and legs to where the sheet was still cool. "'I'm glad we're going tomorrow,' she murmured, as though to herself. "'I like to ride on the train. And mountains again. I love mountains, all blue and blue. We'll be seeing mountains day after tomorrow.' little towns on em that don't smell like people eatin all the time and mountains no mountains between here and chicago her brother said gruffly shut up yes there are she raised herself to her elbow there are some i saw some comin down here that was in virginia and tennessee we don't go through virginia to chicago dumbbell we go through tennessee though not that part of Tennessee. Shut up, I tell you. Here, you get up and go back to your room. No, please, just a little while longer. I'll lie still. Come on, Gus, don't be so crummy. Get out now, he repeated implacably. I'll be still. I won't say a wo No, outside now. Go on, go on, Gus, like I tell you. She heaved herself over nearer. Please, Josh, then I'll go. Well, be quick about it. He turned his face away, and she leaned down and took his ear between her teeth, biting it just a little, making a kind of meaningless maternal sound against his ear. That's enough, he said presently, turning his head and his moistened ear. Get out now. She rose obediently and returned to her room, it seemed to be hotter in here than in his room, so she got up and removed her pajamas and got back in bed and lay on her back, cradling her dark, grave head in her arms and gazing into the darkness. And after a while it wasn't so hot, and it was like she was on a high place, looking away out where mountains faded, dreaming and blue, and on and on into a purple haze under the slanting and solemn music of the sun, She'd see him day after tomorrow. Mountains. End of section 61section 62 of Mosquitoes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Mosquitoes by William Faulkner. Epilogue number seven. Fairchild went directly to the marble and stood before it, clasping his hands at his burly back. The Semitic man sat immediately on entering the room, preempting the single chair. The host was busy beyond the rep curtain which constituted his bedroom, from where he presently reappeared with a bottle of whiskey. He had removed both shirt and undershirt now, and beneath a faint reddish fuzz his chest gleamed with heat, like an oiled gladiator's. "'I see,' Fairchild remarked as the host entered, "'that you too have been caught by this modern-day fetish of virginity. But you have this advantage over us. Yours will remain inviolate without your having to shut your eyes to its goings-on.' You don't have to make any effort to keep yours from being otherwise very satisfactory and very unusual. The greatest part of man's immolation of virginity is, I think, composed of an alarm and a suspicion that someone else may be, as the term is, getting it. Perhaps Gordon's alarm regarding his own particular illusion of it is that someone else may not get it. 
the Semitic man suggested. "'No, I guess not,' Fairchild said. "'He don't expect to sell this to anybody, you know. "'Who would pay out good money for a virginity he couldn't later violate, "'if only to assure himself it was the genuine thing? "'Lita clasping her dog between her thighs could yet be carved out of it, however.' the other pointed out, it is large enough for that, or swan, corrected Fairchild. No, duck, the Semitic man insisted. Americans would prefer a duck, or udders and a fig leaf might be added to the thing as it stands. Isn't that possible, Gordon? Yes, it might be restored, Gordon admitted dryly. He disappeared again beyond the curtain and returned with two heavy tumblers and a shaving mug bearing a name in Gothic lettering of faded gilt. He drew up the bench on which his enamel water pitcher rested, and Fairchild came and sat upon it. Gordon took the shaving mug and went to lean his tall body against the wall. His intolerant hawk's face was like bronze in the unshaded glare of the light. The Semitic man puffed at his cigar. Fairchild raised his glass, squinting through it. Udders and a fig leaf, he repeated. He drank and set his tumbler down to light a cigarette. After all, that is the end of art. I mean, we do get something out of art, the Semitic man agreed. We all admit that. Yes, said Fairchild. Art reminds us of our youth, of that age when life don't need to have her face lifted every so often for you to consider her beautiful. That's about all the virtue there is in art. It's a kind of Battle Creek, Michigan for the spirit. And when it reminds us of youth, we remember grief and forget time. That's something. Something, if all a man has to do is forget time, the Semitic man rejoined. But one who spends his days trying to forget time is like one who spends his time forgetting death or digestion. That's another instance of your unshakable faith in words. It's like morphine languages, a fearful habit to form. You become a bore to all who would otherwise cherish you. Of course, there is the chance that you may be hailed as a genius after you are dead long years, but what is that to you? There will still be high endeavor that ends, as always, with kissing in the dark. But where are you? Time? Time? Why worry about something that takes care of itself so well? You were born with the habit of consuming time. Be satisfied with that. Tom of Bedlam had the only genius for consuming time, that is, to be utterly unaware of it. But you speak for the artists. I am thinking of the majority of us who are not artists, and who need protection from artists, whose time the artists insist on passing for us. We get along quite well with our sleeping and eating and procreating, if you artists only let us alone. But you, accursed, who are not satisfied with the world as it is, and so must try to rebuild the very floor you're standing on, you keep on talking and shouting and gesturing at us until you get us all fidgety and alarmed. So I believe that if art served any purpose at all, it would at least keep the artists themselves occupied. Fairchild raised his glass again. It's more than that. It's getting into life, getting into it, and wrapping it around you, becoming a part of it. Women can do it without art. Old biology takes care of that. But men, men, a woman conceives. Does she care afterward whose seed it was? Not she. And bears, and all the rest of her life, her young troubling years, that is, is filled. Of course the father can look at it occasionally. But in art a man can create without any assistance at all. What he does is his. A perversion, I grant you, but a perversion that builds chart and invents a leer is a pretty good thing. He drank and set his tumbler down. 
creation, reproduction from within? Is the dominating impulse in the world feminine, after all, as aboriginal peoples believe? There is a kind of spider or something. The female is the larger, and when the male goes to her, he goes to death. She devours him during the act of conception. And that's man, a kind of voraciousness that makes an artist stand beside himself with a notebook in his hand, always putting down all the charming things that ever happened to him, killing them for the sake of some problematical something he might or he might not ever use. Listen, he said, love, youth, sorrow and hope and despair, they were nothing at all to me until I found later some need of a particular reaction to put in the mouth of some character of whom I wasn't at that time certain and that I don't yet consider very admirable. But maybe it was because I had to work all the time to earn a living when I was a young man. Perhaps so, the Semitic man agreed. People still believe they have to work to live. Sure, you have to work to live, Fairchild said quickly. You'd naturally say that. If a man has had to deny himself any pleasures during his pleasure in years, he always likes to believe it was necessary. That's where you get your Puritans from. We don't like to see anyone violate laws we observed and get away with it. God knows heaven is a dry reward for abnegation. Fairchild rose and went to stand again before the fluid, passionate fixity of the marble. The end of art, he repeated. I mean, to the consumer, not to us. We have to do it. They don't. They can take it or leave it. Probably Gordon feels the same way about stories that I do about sculpture. But for me, he mused upon the marble for a time. When the statue is completely nude, it has only a coldly formal significance, you know. But when some foreign matter, like a leaf or a fold of drapery, kept there in defiance of gravity by God only knows what, draws the imagination to where the organs of reproduction are concealed, it lends the statue a warmer, a, a more speculative significance, supplied the Semitic man. Speculative significance, which I must admit I require in my sculpture. Certainly the moralists agree with you. Why shouldn't they? The same food nourishes everybody's convictions alike, and a man that earns his bread in a glue factory must get some sort of pleasure from smelling cattle hoofs, or he changes job. There's your perversion, I think. And, the Semitic man said, if you spend your life worrying over sex, it's an added satisfaction to get paid for your time. Yes, but if I earned my bread by means of sex, at least I'd have enough pride about it to be a good, honest whore. Gordon came over and filled the glasses again. Fairchild returned and got his, and prowled aimlessly about the room, examining things. The Semitic man sat with his handkerchief spread over his bald head. He regarded Gordon's naked torso with envious wonder. They don't seem to bother you at all he stated fretfully. Look here, Fairchild called suddenly. He had unswaddled a damp cloth from something, and he now bent over his find. Come here, Julius. The Semitic man rose and joined him. It was clay, yet damp, and from out its dull, dead grayness Mrs. Morier looked at them, her chins harshly and her flaccid jaw muscles with savage verisimilitude. Her eyes were caverns, thumbed with two motions, into the dead, familiar astonishment of her face. And yet, behind them, somewhere within those empty sockets, behind all her familiar surprise, there was something else, something that exposed her face for the mask it was, and still more, a mask unaware. "'Well, I'm damned,' Fairchild said slowly, staring at it. I've known her for a year, and Gordon comes along after four days. 
"'Well, I'll be damned,' he said again. "'I could have told you,' the Semitic man said, "'but I wanted you to get it by yourself. "'I don't see how you missed it. "'I don't see how anyone with your faith in your fellow man "'could believe that anyone could be as silly as she without reason. "'An explanation for silliness?' Fairchild repeated. "'Does her sort of silliness require explanation?' "'It shouts it,' the other answered. "'Look how Gordon got it right away.' "'That's so,' Fairchild admitted. "'He gazed at the face again. "'Then he looked at Gordon with envious admiration. "'And you got it right away, didn't you?' "'Gordon was replenishing the glasses again. "'He couldn't have missed it,' the Semitic man repeated. I don't see how you missed it. You are reasonably keen about people, sooner or later. Well, I guess I missed her, Fairchild returned, and extended his tumbler. But it's the usual thing, ain't it? Plantations and things, first family and all that. Something like that, the Semitic man agreed. He returned to his chair, and Fairchild sat again beside the water pitcher. She's a northerner herself, married it. Her husband must have been pretty old when they married. That's what explains her, I think. What does? Being a northerner or marriage? Marriage starts and explains lots of things about us, just like singleness or widowhood does. And I guess the Ohio River can affect your destiny, too. But how does it explain her? The story is that her people forced her to marry old Maurier. He had been overseer on a big place before the Civil War. He disappeared in 63, and when the war was over, he turned up again riding a horse with a Union Army cavalry saddle and a hundred thousand dollars in uncut federal notes for a saddle blanket. Lord knows what the amount really was, or how he got it but it was enough to establish him. Money. You can't argue against money. You only protest. Everybody expected him to splurge about with his money, show up the penniless aristocracy, that sort of thing, work out some of the inhibitions he must have developed during his overseer days. But he didn't. Perhaps he'd got rid of his inhibitions during his sojourn at the war. Anyway, he failed to live up to character, so people decided that he was a moral coward, that he was off somewhere in a hole with his money like a rat. And this was the general opinion until a rumor got out about several rather raw land deals in which he was assisted by a Jew named Julius Kaufman, who was acquiring a fortune and an unsavory name during those years immediately following General Butler's assumption of the local purple. And when the smoke finally cleared somewhat, he had more money than ever rumor could compute, and he was the proprietor of that plantation on which he had once been a head servant, and within a decade he was landed gentry. I don't doubt but that he had dug up some blue-blood emigre ancestry, he was a small, shrewd man, a cold and violent man, just the sort to have an unimpeachable genealogy. Humorless and shrewd, but I don't doubt that he sat at times in the halls of his newly adopted fathers and laughed. The story is that her father came to New Orleans on a business trip with a blessing from Washington. She was young then probably a background of an exclusive school and a social future, the taken-for-granted capital letter kind, but all somehow rather precarious, cabbage and a footman to serve it, a salon in which they sat politely, surrounded by objects and spoke good French, and bailiff's men on the veranda and the butcher's bill in the kitchen, gentility, evening clothes without fresh linen underneath. I imagine he, her father, was pretty near at the end of his rope. Some government appointment, I imagine, brought him south. 
hijacking privileges with official sanction, you know. The whole family seem to have found our climate salubrious, though what with hibiscus and mimosa on the lawn instead of bailiffs, and our dulcet airs after the rigors of New England, and she cut quite a figure among the jeunesse dorée of the nineties, fell in love with a young chap, penniless but real people, who led cotillions and went without gloves to send her flowers and glacé trifles from the rue Vendôme, and sang to a guitar among the hibiscus and mimosa when stars were wont to rise. Old Maurier had made a bid himself in the meantime. Maurier was not yet accepted by the noblesse, but you can't ignore money, you know. You can only protest and tremble. It took my people to teach the world that. And so, the Semitic man drained his glass. He continued, You know how it is, how there comes a certain moment in the course of human events during which everything, public attention, circumstance, even destiny itself, is caught at the single possible instant, and the actions of certain people, for no reason at all, become of paramount interest and importance to the rest of the world. That's how it was with these people. There were wagers laid. A famous gambler even made a book on it. And all the time she went about her affairs, her parties and routs and balls, behind that cold Dresden china mask of hers, she was quite beautiful then, they say. People always paint in her, you know. Her face in every exhibition, her name a byword in the street, and a toast at Antoine's or the St. Charles. But then, perhaps nothing went on behind that mask at all. Of course there was, said Fairchild quickly, for the sake of the story, if nothing else. Pride, anyway, I guess, she had that. The Semitic man reached for the bottle. Gordon came and refilled his mug. It must have been pretty hard for her, even if there was only pride to suffer. But women can stand anything. And enjoy it, Fairchild put in. But go on. That's all. They were married in the cathedral. She wasn't a Catholic. Ireland had yet to migrate in any sizable quantities, when her people established themselves in New England. That was another thing, mind you. And her horseless Lochinvar was present. Bets had been made that if he stayed away or passed the word, no one would attend at all. Maurier was still regarded. Well, imagine for yourself a situation like that, a tradition of ease unassailable and unshakable gone to pieces right under you and out of the wreckage rising a man who once held your stirrup while you mounted. Thirty years is barely the adolescence of bitterness, you know. I'd like to have seen her coming out of the church afterward. They would have had a canopy leading from the door to the carriage. There must have been a canopy, and flowers, heavy ones. Lochinvar would have sent gardenias, and she— decked out in all the pagan trappings of innocence, and her beautiful secret face beside that cold, violent man, graying now, but you have remarked how it takes the harlequinade of aristocracy to really reveal peasant blood, haven't you? And her Lochinvar to wish her God speed, watching her ankles as she got into the carriage. They never had any children— Maurier may have been too old. She herself may have been barren. Often that type is. But I don't think so. I believe. But who knows? I don't. Anyway, that explains her to me. At first you think it's just silliness, lack of occupation, a tub of washing to be exact. But I see something thwarted back of it all, something stifled, yet which won't quite die. A virgin, Fairchild said immediately. That's what it is, exactly. Foolin' with sex, kind of dabbing at it, like a kitten at a ball of string. She missed something. 
her body told her so insisted forced her to try to remedy it and fill the vacuum but now her body is old it no longer remembers that it missed anything and all she has left is a habit the ghost of a need to rectify something the lack of which her body has long since forgotten about the semitic man lit his cold cigar again fairchild gazed at his glass turning it this way and that slowly in his hand gordon stood yet against the wall looking beyond them and watching something not in this room the semitic man slapped his other wrist then wiped his palm on his handkerchief fairchild spoke and i missed it missed it clean he mused and then gordon say he looked up suddenly how did you happen to learn all this julius kaufman was my grandfather the semitic man replied oh well it's a good thing you told me about it i guess i won't have another chance to get anything from her at first hand he chuckled without mirth oh yes you will the other told him she won't hold this boat party against us people are far more tolerant of artists than artists are of people he puffed at his cigar for a time the trouble with you he said is that you don't act right at all you are the most disappointing artist i know mark frost is much nearer the genuine thing than you are but then he's got more time to be a genius than you have you spend too much time writing and that's where gordon is going to fall down you and he typify genius de qualité and people who own motor cars and food draw the line just at negligé somewhere about the collarbone and remind me to give that to mark tomorrow it struck me several times these last few days that he needs a new one speaking of decolleté fairchild mopped his face again what is it that makes a man drink whiskey on a night like this anyway i don't know the other answered perhaps it's a scheme of nature's to provide for our italian immigrants or of providence prohibition for the latin politics for the irish invented he them fairchild filled his glass again unsteadily might as well make a good job of it he said gordon yet leaned against the wall motionless and remote fairchild continued italians and irish where do we home-grown nordics come in what has he invented for us nothing the semitic man answered you invented providence fairchild raised his tumbler gulping and a part of the liquor ran over thinly and trickled from both corners of his mouth down his chin then he set the glass down and stared at the other with a mild astonishment i am afraid he enunciated carefully that that one is going to do the business for me he wiped his chin unsteadily and moving he struck his empty glass to the floor the semitic man groaned now we'll have to move again just when i had become inured to them or perhaps you'd like to lie down for a while fairchild sat and mused a moment no i don't he stated thickly if i lie down i wouldn't get up again little air fresh air i'll go outside the semitic man rose and helped him to his feet fairchild pulled himself together come along gordon i've got to get outside for a while gordon came out of his dream he came and raised the bottle to the light and divided it between his mug and the semitic man's tumbler and supporting fairchild between them they drank then fairchild must examine the marble again i think it's kind of nice he stood before it swaying swallowing the hot salty liquid that continued to fill his throat you kind of wish she could talk don't you it would be sort of like wind through trees no not talk you'd like to watch her from a distance on a may morning 
bathing in a pool where there were a lot of poplar trees. Now this is the way to forget your grief. She is not blonde, Gordon said harshly, holding the empty bottle in his hand. She is dark, darker than fire. She is more terrible and beautiful than fire. He ceased and stared at them. Then he raised the bottle and hurled it crashing into the huge littered fireplace. Not, murmured Fairchild, trying to focus his eyes. Marble, purity, Gordon said in his harsh, intolerant voice. Pure because they have yet to discover some way to make it unpure. They would if they could, God damn them. He stared at them for a moment from beneath his caverned bronze brows. His eyes were pale as two bits of steel. Forget grief, he repeated harshly. Only an idiot has no grief. Only a fool would forget it. What else is there in this world sharp enough to stick to your guts? He took the thin coat from behind the door and put it on over his naked torso and they helped Fairchild from the room and down the dark stairs, abruptly subdued and quiet. End of section 62《Section 63 of Mosquitoes》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Mosquitoes by William Faulkner. Epilogue, Part 8. Mark Frost stood on the corner, frankly exasperated. The street light sprayed his tall, ghostly figure with shadows of bitten late August leaves, and he stood in indecision, musing fretfully. His evening was spoiled, too late to instigate anything on his own hook, or to join anyone else's party, too soon to go home. Mark Frost depended utterly upon other people to get his time passed. He was annoyed principally with Mrs. Morier, annoyed and unpleasantly shocked and puzzled, at her strange, not coldness, rather detachment, aloofness, callousness. If you were at all artistic, if you had any taint of art in your blood, dining with her filled the evening. But now, to-night, never saw the old girl so bloodless in the presence of genius, he told himself, didn't seem to give a damn whether I stayed or not. But perhaps she doesn't feel well, after the recent excitement, he added generously, being a woman, too. He had completely forgotten about the niece, the sepulchral moth of his heart had completely forgotten that temporary flame. His car, owned and operated by the city, came along presently, and instinct got him aboard. Instinct also took the proper transfer for him, but a crumb of precaution, or laziness at the transfer point, hailed him amid automobiles bearing the young, enchanted of various ages, swiftly toward nowhere or less, to and within a corner drugstore where was a telephone. His number cost him a nickel. Hello, it's me. Thought you were going out tonight. Yes, I did. Very stupid party, though. I couldn't stick it. So you decided to stay in, did you? No, I just thought I'd call you up. You're welcome. I have another button off. Thanks. I'll bring it next time I'm out that way. Tonight? Well, huh? All right. I'll come on out. Goodbye. His very ghostliness seemed to annihilate space. He invariably arrived after you had forgotten about him and before you expected him. But she had known him for a long time, and ere he could ring, she appeared in a window overhead and dropped the latch-key, and he retrieved its forlorn clink and let himself into the dark hall, 
A light gleamed dimly from the stairhead, where she leaned to watch the thin evaporation of his hair as he mounted. "'I'm all alone tonight,' she remarked. "'The folks are gone for the weekend. They didn't expect me back until Sunday.' "'That's good,' he answered. "'I don't feel up to talking to your mother tonight.' "'Neither do I. Not to anybody, after these last four days. Come in.' It was a vaguely bookish room, in the middle of which a heavy, hot-looking, champagne-shaded piano lamp cast an oasis of light upon a dull blue brocaded divan. Mark Frost went immediately to the divan and lay at full length upon it. Then he moved again and extracted a package of cigarettes from his jacket. Miss Jameson accepted one, and he relaxed again and groaned with hollow relief. "'I'm too comfortable,' he said. "'I'm really ashamed to be so comfortable.' Miss Jameson drew up a chair, just without the oasis of light. "'Help yourself,' she replied. "'There's nobody here but us. The family won't be back until Sunday night.' "'Elegant,' Mark Frost murmured. He laid his arm across his face, shading his eyes. "'Whole house to yourself. You're lucky.' "'Lord, I'm glad to be off that boat. Never again for me.' "'Don't mention that boat,' Miss Jameson shuddered. "'I think it'll be never again for any of that party. "'From the way Mrs. Morier talked this morning. "'Not for Dawson and Julius, anyway. "'Did she send a car back for them?' "'No. After yesterday they could have fallen overboard, "'and she wouldn't even have notified the police.' "'But let's don't talk about that trip any more,' she said wearily. She sat just beyond the radius of light, a vague, humorless fragility. Mark Frost lay on his back, smoking a cigarette. She said, "'While I think of it, will you be sure to lock the door after you? I'll be here alone tonight.' "'All right,' he promised from beneath his arm." His pale, prehensile mouth released the cigarette, and his arm swung it outward to where he hoped there was an ashtray. The ashtray wasn't there, and his hand made a series of futile, dabbing motions, until Miss Jameson leaned forward and moved the ashtray into the automatic ellipsis of his hand. After a while she leaned forward again and crushed out her cigarette. A clock somewhere behind him tapped monotonously at silence, and she moved restlessly in her chair, and presently she leaned and took another cigarette from his pack. Mark Frost removed his arm long enough to raise the pack to his vision and count the remaining cigarettes. Then he replaced his arm. "'You're quiet tonight,' she remarked. He grunted, and once more she leaned forward and ground out her half-smoked cigarette with decision. She rose. I'm going to take off some clothes and get into something cooler. Nobody here to object. Excuse me a moment. He grunted again beneath his arm, and she went away from the oasis of light. She opened the door of her room and stood in the darkness just within the door a moment. Then she closed the door audibly, stood for a moment, then opened it again slightly and pressed the light switch. She went to her dressing table and switched on two small shaded electric candles there, and returned and switched off the ceiling light. She considered for a while, then she returned to the door and stood with the knob in her hand. Then, without closing it, she went back to the dressing table and turned off one of the lights there. This left the room filled with a soft pinkish glow, in which a hushed gleaming of crystal on the dressing table was the only distinguishable feature. She removed her dress hastily, and stood in her underthings with a kind of cringing, passive courage, but there was still no sound of movement beyond the door, and she switched on the other light again and examined herself in the mirror. She mused again, examining her frail body in its intimate garment. Then she ran swiftly and silently to a chest of drawers, and in a locked drawer she sought feverishly among a delicate, neat mass of sheer fabric, coming at last upon an embroidered nightdress, neatly folded and unworn, 
and sent it faintly. Then, standing where the door, should it be opened, would conceal her for a moment, she slipped the gown over her head, and from beneath it she removed the undergarment. Then she took her reckless, troubled heart, and the fragile and humorless calmness in which it beat, back to the dressing-table, and sitting before the mirror she assumed a studied pose, combing and combing out her long, uninteresting hair. Mark Frost lay at length on the divan, as was his habit, shading his eyes with his arm. At intervals he roused himself to light a fresh cigarette, at each time counting the diminishing few that remained with static alarm. A clock ticked regularly somewhere in the room. The soft light from the lamp bathed him in a champagne-colored and motionless sea. He raised a fresh cigarette, his pale, prehensile mouth wrapped about it as though his mouth were a separate organism. But after a while there were no more cigarettes, and roused temporarily, he remarked his hostess's prolonged absence. But he lay back again, luxuriating in quiet and the suave surface on which he rested. But before long he raised the empty cigarette package and groaned dismally, and rose and prowled quietly about the room, hoping perhaps to find one cigarette someone had forgotten, but there was none. The couch drew him, and he returned to the oasis of light, where he discovered and captured the practically whole cigarette which Miss Jameson had discarded. Snipe, he murmured with sepulchral humorlessness, and he fired it, averting his head, lest he lose his eyelashes in doing so, and he lay once more, shading his eyes with his arm. The clock ticked on in the silence. It seemed to be directly behind him. If he could just roll his eyes a bit further back into his skull, he'd better look anyhow after a while. After midnight only one trolley to the hour. If he missed the twelve o'clock car... So after a while he did look, having to move to do so, and he immediately rose from the divan in a mad, jointless haste. Fortunately he remembered where he had left his hat, and he caught it up and plunged down the stairs and on through the dark hall. He blundered into a thing or so, but the pale rectangle of the glass door guided him, and after a violent struggle he opened it and leaping forth he crashed it behind him. It failed to catch, and in mid-flight down the steps he glanced wildly back at the growing darkness of its gap, that revealed at the top edge a vague gleam from the light at the head of the stairs. The corner was not far, and as he ran loosely and frantically toward it, there came among the grave gesturing of tall palms a worn and bloodless rumor of the dying moon, and the rising hum of the street-car crashed among the trees. He saw its lighted windows halt, heard its hum cease, saw the windows move again, and heard its hum rise swelling, drowning his hoarse reiterated cries. But the conductor saw him at last, and pulled the cord again, and the car halted once more, humming impatiently, and Mark Frost plunged his long, ungovernable legs across the soft, slumberous glare of polished asphalt, and clawed his panting, ghostly body through the open doors, out of which the conductor leaned, calling to him, "'Come on, come on! This ain't a taxi!' End of section 63。section 64 of Mosquitoes。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit LibriVox.org。recording by Rita Boutros。Mosquitoes by William Faulkner。epilogue。Part 9. Three gray, soft-footed priests had passed on, but in an interval hushed by windowless old walls, there lingers yet a thin celibate despair. 
beneath a high stone gate with a crest and a device in carven stone a beggar lies nursing in his hand a crust of bread gordon fairchild and the semitic man walked in the dark city above them the sky a heavy voluptuous night and huge hot stars like wilting gardenias about them streets narrow shallow canyons of shadow rich with decay and laced with delicate ironwork scarcely seen spring is in the world somewhere like a blown keen reed high and fiery cold he does not yet see it a shape which he will know he does not yet see it the three priests pass on the walls have hushed their grey and unshod feet in a doorway slightly ajar were women their faces in the starlight flat and pallid and rife odorous and exciting and unchaste gordon hello dempsey loomed hatless above his two companions he strode on paying the women no heed fairchild lagged the semitic man perforce also a woman laughed rife and hushed and rich in the odorous dark come in boys lots of girls cool you off come in boys the semitic man drew fairchild onward babbling excitedly that's it that's it you walk along a dark street in the dark the dark is close and intimate about you hold in all things anything you need only put out your hand to touch life to feel the beating heart of life beauty a thing unseen suggested natural and fecund and foul you don't stop for it you pass on the semitic man drew him onward after gordon's tall striding i love three things rats like dull and cunning silver keen and plump as death steal out to gnaw the crust held loosely by the beggar beneath the stone gate unreproved they swarm about his still recumbent shape exploring his clothing in an obscene silence dragging their hot bellies over his lean and aged chilled body sniffing his intimate parts i love three things he drew fairchild onward babbling in an ecstasy a voice a touch a sound life going on about you unseen in the close dark beyond these walls these bricks fairchild stopped laying his hand against the heat drunken wall beside him staring at his friend in the starlight gordon strode on ahead in this dark room or that dark room you want to go into all the streets of all the cities men live in to look into all the darkened rooms in the world not with curiosity not with dread nor doubt nor disapproval but humbly gently as you would steal in to look at a sleeping child not to disturb it then as one rat they flash away and secure again and still they become as a row of cigarettes unwinking at a single level the beggar whose hand yet shapes his stolen crust sleeps beneath the stone gate fairchild babbled on gordon striding on ahead turned and passed through a door the door swung open letting a sheet of light fall outward across the pavement then the door swung to snatching the sheet of light again the semitic man grasped fairchild's arm and he halted about him the city swooned in a voluption of dark and heat a sleep which was not sleep and dark and heat lapped his burly short body about with the hidden eternal pulse of the world above him above the shallow serrated canyon of the street huge hot stars burned at the heart of things three more priests barefoot in robes the color of silence appear from nowhere they are speeding after the first three when they spy the beggar beneath the stone gate they pause above him the walls hush away their grey and sibilant footsteps the rats are motionless as a row of cigarettes 
Gordon reappeared, looming above the other two in the hushed starlight. He held in his hand a bottle. The priests draw nearer, touching one another, leaning diffidently above the beggar in the empty street, while silence comes slow as a procession of nuns with breathing blent. Above the hushing walls, a thing wild and passionate, remote and sad, shrill as pipes and yet unheard. Beneath it, soundless shapes amid which, vaguely, a maiden in an ungirdled robe and with a thin bright chain between her ankles, and a sound of far lamenting. They went on around a corner and into a darker street. Gordon stopped again, brooding and remote. He raised the bottle against the sky. Yes, bitter and new as fire, fueled close now with sleep, hushed her strange and ardent fire, a chrysalis of fire whitely, splendid and new as fire. He drank, listening to the measured beat of his wild, bitter heart. Then he passed the bottle to his companions, brooding his hawk's face above them against the sky. The others drank, they went on through the dark city. The beggar yet sleeps, shaping his stolen crust, and one of the priests says, Do you require aught of man, brother? Just above the silence, amid the shapes, a young naked boy, daubed with vermilion, carrying casually a crown. He moves erratic with senseless laughter, and the headless naked body of a woman carved of ebony surrounded by women wearing skins of slain beasts and chained one to another lamenting the beggar makes no reply he does not stir and the second priest leans nearer his pale half-shadowed face beneath his high white brow he is not asleep for his eyes stare quietly past the three priests without remarking them the third priest leans down, raising his voice, Brother! They stopped and drank again. Then they went on, the Semitic man carrying the bottle, nursing it against his breast. I love three things. Fairchild walked erratically beside him. Above him, among the mad stars, Gordon's bearded head. The night was full and rich, smelling of streets and people of secret beings and things. The beggar does not move, and the priest's voice is a dark bird seeking its way from out a cage. Above the silence, between it and the antic sky, there grows a sound like that of the sea heard afar off. The three priests gaze at one another. The beggar lies motionless beneath the stone gate. The rats stare their waiting cigarettes upon the scene. I love three things, gold, marble, and purple. The sound grows. Amid shadows and echoes it becomes a wind thunderous from hills with the clashing hooves of centaurs. The headless black woman is a carven agony beyond the fading placidity of the ungirdled maiden and as the shadows and echoes blend, the chained women raise their voices anew, lamenting thinly. They were accosted, whispers from every doorway, hands unchaste and importunate, and rife in the tense wild darkness. Fairchild wavered beside him, and Gordon stopped again. "'I'm going in here,' he said. "'Give me some money.' The Semitic man gave him a nameless bill. The wind rushes on, becoming filled with leaping figures, antic as flames, and a sound of pipes, fiery cult, carves the world darkly out of space. The centaur's hooves clash, storming. Shrill voices ride the storm like gusty birds, wild and passionate and sad. A door opened in the wall, Gordon entered, and before the door closed again, they saw him in a narrow passageway lift a woman from the shadow and raise her against the mad stars, 
smothering her squeal against his tall kiss. Then voices and sounds, shadows and echoes change form, swirling, becoming the headless, armless, legless torso of a girl, motionless and virginal, and passionately eternal, before the shadows and echoes whirl away. They went on. The Semitic man nursed the bottle against his breast. I love three things. Dante invented Beatrice, creating himself a maid that life had not had time to create, and laid upon her frail and unbowed shoulders the whole burden of man's history, of his impossible heart's desire. At last one priest, becoming bolder, leans yet nearer, and slips his hand beneath the beggar's sorry robe against his heart. It is cold. Suddenly Fairchild stumbled heavily beside him and would have fallen. He held Fairchild up and supported him to the wall, and Fairchild leaned against the wall, his head tilted back, hatless, staring into the sky, listening to the dark and measured beating of the heart of things. That's what it is, genius. He spoke slowly, distinctly, staring into the sky. People confuse it so, you see. They have got it now, to where it signifies only an active state of the mind in which a picture is painted or a poem is written, when it is not that at all. It is that passion weak of the heart, that instant of timeless beatitude, which some never know, which some, I suppose, gain at will, which others gain through an outside agency like alcohol, like tonight, that passive state of the heart with which the mind, the brain, has nothing to do at all, in which the hackneyed accidents which make up this world love and life and death and sex and sorrow brought together by chance in perfect proportions take on a kind of splendid and timeless beauty like the assault of the white hands and her tristan with that clean high-hearted dullness of his like that young lady something that some government executed asking permission, and touching with a kind of sober wonder the edge of the knife that was to cut her head off, like a red-haired girl, an idiot, turning in a white dress beneath a wisteria-covered trellis on a late sunny afternoon in May. He leaned against the wall, staring into the hushed mad sky, hearing the dark and simple heart of things, from beyond a cornice there came at last a cold and bloodless rumor of the dying moon. The Semitic man nursed the bottle against his breast. I love three things, gold, marble, and purple. The priests cross themselves while the nuns of silence blend anew their breath and pass on. Soon the high windowless walls have hushed away their thin celibate despair. The rats are arrogant as cigarettes. After a while they steal forth again, climbing over the beggar, dragging their hot bellies over him, exploring unreproved his private parts. Somewhere above the dark street, above the wind-carved hills, beyond the silence, thin pipes unhurt, wild and passionate and sad. Form, solidity, color, he said to his own dark and passionate heart, and to Fairchild beside him, leaning against a dark wall, vomiting. End of section 64《セクション65 of Mosquitoes》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros.《モスキトーズ》by William Faulkner. Epilogue, Part 10
the rectangle of light yet fell outward across the alleyway beyond the half-length lattice blind the typewriter yet leaped and thundered fairchild the manipulator of the machine felt a vague annoyance like knowing that someone is trying to waken you from a pleasant dream knowing that if you resist the dream will be broken oh fairchild he concentrated again trying to exercise the ravisher of his heart's beatitude by banging louder on the keyboard but at last there came a timid knock at the blind damn he surrendered come in he bellowed raising his head my god where did you come from i just let you in about ten minutes ago didn't i then he saw his caller's face what's the matter friend he asked quickly sick mr taliaferro stood blinking in the light then he entered slowly and drooped upon a chair worse than that he answered with utter despondence the large man wheeled heavily to face him need a doctor or anything the caller buried his face in his hands no no a doctor can't help me well what do you want then i'm busy what is it i believe i want a drink of whiskey mr taliaferro said at last if it's no trouble he added with his customary polite diffidence he raised a stricken face for a moment a terrible thing happened to me tonight. He lowered his face to his hands again, and the other rose and returned presently with a tumbler half full of liquor. Mr. Taliaferro accepted it gratefully. He took a swallow, then lowered the glass shakily. I simply must talk to someone. A terrible thing happened to me. He brooded for a moment. It was my last opportunity, you see he burst out suddenly for fairchild now or you it would be different but for me mr taliaferro hid his face in his free hand a terrible thing happened to me he repeated well spit it out then but be quick about it mr taliaferro fumbled his handkerchief and weakly mopped his face the other sat watching him impatiently well just as i'd planned i pretended indifference said that i didn't care to dance tonight. but she said ah oh, come along do you think i came out just to sit in the park or something like that and when i put my arm around her around who around her and when i tried to kiss her she just put but where was this in the cab i haven't a car you see though I am planning to buy one next year. And she just put her elbow under my chin and choked me until I had to move back to my side of the seat. And she said, I never dance in private or without music, Mr. Man. And then, in God's name, friend, what are you raving about? About ju about that girl I was with this evening. And so we went to dance, and I was petting her a bit, just as I had done on the boat, no more, I assure you, and she told me immediately to stop. She said something about not having lumbago, and yet, all the time we were on the yacht, she never objected once. Mr. Taliaferro looked at his host with polite, uncomprehending astonishment. Then he sighed and finished the whiskey, and set the glass near his feet. "'Good Lord!' the other murmured in a hushed tone. Mr. Taliaferro continued more briskly, and quite soon I remarked that her attention was engaged by something or someone behind me. She was dodging her head this way and that as we danced, and getting out of step and saying, "'Pardon me,' but when I tried to see what it was, I could discover nothing at all to engage her like that. So I said, "'What are you thinking of?' And she said, "'Huh? Like that?' And I said, "'I can tell you what you are thinking of.' And she said, "'Who, me? What am I thinking of?' Still trying to see something behind me, mind you. Then I saw that she was smiling also, and I said, you are thinking of me, and she said, oh, was I? 
"'Good God!' the other murmured. "'Yes,' agreed Mr. Taliaferro unhappily. He continued briskly, however. "'And so I said, as I'd planned, "'I'm tired of this place. Let's go.' She demurred, but I was firm, and so at last she consented, and told me to run down and engage a cab, and she would join me on the street. I should have suspected something then, but I didn't. I ran down and engaged a cab. I gave the driver ten dollars, and he agreed to drive out on some unfrequented road, and to stop and pretend that he had lost something back along the road and to wait there until I blew the horn for him. So I waited and waited. She didn't appear, so at last I ordered the cab to wait, and I ran back upstairs. I didn't see her in the ante-room, so I went back to the dancing floor. He ceased and sat for a while in a brooding dejection. Well, the other prompted, Mr. Taliaferro sighed. I swear, I think I'll give it up. Never have anything to do with them any more. When I returned to the dancing floor, I looked for her at the table where we had been sitting. She was not there, and for a moment I couldn't find her. But presently I saw her, dancing, with a man I had never seen before. A large man like you. I didn't know what to think. I decided, finally, he was a friend of hers with whom she was dancing until I should return, having misunderstood our arrangement about meeting below. Yet she had told me herself to await her on the street. That's what confused me. I waited at the door until I finally caught her eye and I signaled to her. She flipped her hand in reply as though she desired that I wait until the dance was finished. So I stood there. Other people were entering and leaving, but I kept my place near the door where she could find me without difficulty. But when the music ceased, they went to a table and sat down and called to a waiter, and she didn't even glance toward me again. I began to get angry then. I walked over to them. I didn't want everyone to see that I was angry, so I bowed to them. And she looked up at me and said, "'Why, hello, I thought you'd left me, "'and so this kind gentleman was kind enough to take me home.' "'You damn right I will,' the man said, popping his eyes at me. "'Who's he?' "'You see,' Mr. Taliaferro interpolated, "'I'm trying to talk as he did. "'I can't imitate his execrable speech. "'You see, it wouldn't have been so, so... "'I wouldn't have felt so helpless had he spoken proper English.' But the way he said things, there seemed to be no possible rejoinder. You see? Go on, go on, the other said. And she said, why, he's a little friend of mine. And the man said, well, it's time little boys like him was in bed. He looked at me hard, but I ignored him and said firmly, come, Miss Steinbauer, our taxi is waiting. Then he said, "'Herb, you ain't trying to take my girl, are you?' I told him that she had come with me, firmly, you know, and then she said, "'Run along. You are tired of dancing. I ain't. So I'm going to stay and dance with this nice man. Good night.' She was smiling again. I could see that they were ridiculing me, and then he laughed like a horse. "'Beat it, brother,' he said. "'She's gave you the air.' Come back tomorrow. Well, when I saw his fat red face all full of teeth, I wanted to hit him. But I remembered myself in time, my position in the city and my friends, he explained. So I just looked at them and turned and walked away. Of course, everyone had seen and heard it all. As I went through the door, a waiter said to me, Hard luck, fella, but they will do it. Mr. Taliaferro mused again in a sort of polite incomprehension, more of bewilderment than anger or even dejection. He sighed again. And on top of all that, the cab driver had gone off with my ten dollars. The other man looked at Mr. Taliaferro with utter admiration. O oh, thou above the thunder and above the excursions and alarms, regard your masterpiece! Balzac, 
chew thy bitter thumbs and here i am wasting my damn life trying to invent people by means of the written word his face became suddenly suffused he rose towering get to hell out of here he roared you have made me sick mr taliaferro rose obediently his hopeless dejection invested him again but what am i to do 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 go to a brothel if you want a girl or if you are afraid someone will come in and take her away from you get out on the street and pick one up bring her here if you like but in christ's dear name don't ever talk to me again you have already damaged my ego beyond repair do you want another drink mr taliaferro sighed again and shook his head thanks just the same he answered whiskey can't help me any the large man took his arm and kicking the blind outward he helped mr taliaferro kindly but firmly into the alleyway then the blind swung to again and mr taliaferro stood for a time listening to the frantic typewriter watching planes of shadow letting the darkness soothe him a cat slinking regarded him then flashed a swift dingy streak across the alley he followed it with his eyes in a slow misery with envy love was so simple for cats mostly noise success didn't seem to make much difference he sighed and walked slowly on leaving the thundering typewriter behind presently he turned a corner and heard it no more from beyond a cornice there came at last a cold and bloodless rumor of the dying moon his decorous pace spaced away streets interesting with the darkness and as he walked he marveled that he could be inwardly so despairing yet outwardly the same as ever i wonder if it does show on me he thought it is because i am getting old that women are not attracted to me yet i know any number of men of my age and more who get women easily or say they do it is something i do not possess something i have never had and soon he would be married again mr taliaferro seeing freedom and youth deserting him again had known at first a clear sharp regret almost a despair realizing that marriage this time would be a climacteric that after this he would be definitely no longer young and a final flare of freedom and youth had surged in him like a dying flame but now as he walked dark streets beneath the hot heavy sky and the mad wilting gardenias of stars feeling empty and a little tired and hearing his grumbling skeleton that smug and dour and unshakable comrade who loves so well to say i told you so he found himself looking forward to marriage with a thin but definite relief as a solution to his problem yes he told himself sighing again chastity is expected of married men or at least they don't lose caste by it but it was unbearable to believe that he had never had the power to stir women that he had been always a firearm unloaded and unaware of it no it's something i can do or say that i have not yet discovered as he turned into the quiet street in which he lived he saw two people in a doorway embracing he hurried on in his rooms at last he slowly removed his coat and hung it neatly in a closet without being aware that he had performed the rite at all then from his bathroom he got a metal machine with a hand pump attached and he quartered the room methodically with an acrid spraying of penny royal on each downstroke there was a faint comfortable resistance though the plunger came back quite easily like breathing back and forth and back and forth a rhythm something i can do something i can say he repeated to the rhythm of his arm 
the liquid hissed pungently, dissolving into the atmosphere, permeating it. Something I can do, something I can say. There must be, there must be. Surely a man would not be endowed with an impulse and yet be denied the ability to slake it. Something I can say. His arm moved swifter and swifter, spraying the liquid into the air in short hissing jets. He ceased and felt for his handkerchief before he recalled that it was in his coat. His fingers discovered something, though, and clasping his reeking machine, he removed from his hip pocket a small round metal box, and he held it in his hand, gazing at it. Agnes Mabel Becky, he read, and he laughed a short, mirthless laugh. Then he moved slowly to his chest of drawers and hid the small box carefully away in its usual place, and returned to the closet where his coat hung, and got his handkerchief and mopped his brow with it. But must I become an old man before I discover what it is? Old, old, an old man before I have lived at all. He went slowly to the bathroom and replaced the pump, and returned with a basin of warm water. He set the basin on the floor, and went again to the mirror and examined himself. His hair was getting thin, there was no question about that. Can't even keep my hair, he thought bitterly, and his thirty-eight years showed in his face. He was not fleshily inclined, yet the skin under his jaw was becoming loose, flabby. He sighed and completed his disrobing, putting his clothing neatly and automatically away as he removed it. On the table beside his chair was a box of flavored digestive lozenges, and presently he sat with his feet in the warm water, chewing one of the tablets. The water mounted warmly through his thin body, soothing him. The pungent lozenge between his slow jaws gave him a temporary surcease. Let's see, he mused to his rhythmic mastication, calmly reviewing the evening. Where did I go wrong tonight? My plan was good. Fairchild himself admitted that. Let me think. His jaws ceased, and his gaze brooded on a photograph of his late wife on the opposite wall. Why is it that they never act as you had calculated? You can allow for every contingency, and yet they will always do something else, something they themselves could not have imagined nor devised beforehand. I have been too gentle with them. I have allowed too much leeway for the intervention of their natural perversity and of sheer chance. That has been my mistake every time, giving them dinners and shows right away, allowing them to regulate me to the position of a suitor, of one waiting upon their pleasure. The trick, the only trick, is to bully them, to dominate them from the start, never employ wiles, and never allow them the opportunity to employ wiles. The oldest technique in the world, a club, by God, that's it! He dried his feet swiftly and thrust them into his bedroom slippers and went to the telephone and gave a number. "'That's the trick, exactly,' he whispered exultantly, and then in his ear was a sleepy, masculine voice. "'Fairchild, so sorry to disturb you, but I have it at last.' A muffled, inarticulate sound came over the wire, but he rushed on, unheeding. I learned through a mistake tonight. The trouble is, I haven't been bold enough with them. I have been afraid of frightening them away. Listen, I will bring her here. I will not take no. I will be cruel and hard, brutal if necessary, until she begs for my love. What do you think of that? Hello? A fair child? An interval filled with a remote buzzing. Then a female voice said, "'You tell em, big boy. Treat em rough.'" End of Section 65 End of Mosquitoes by William Faulkner